Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the General Council uh, meeting for September 24th, 2018. Appreciate everybody attending in the gallery as well. It is now 5 o'clock on the notes, and I'll call things to order. Has everybody had an opportunity to review the agenda for this evening? Conditions or recommendations? Motions for us? Councillor Connick? I would so move we adopt the agenda as presented. Thank you very much. Don't see a lot of other interests, so I'll call the question then. All those in favor? Thank you very much. And we'll move down to uh, minutes of our last uh, meeting, September 10th. We had an opportunity to review those. Councillor Jacobson? I move we adopt the minutes from September 10, 2018 as presented. Thank you. I don't see any other uh, interest in any changes, so all those in favor? Thank you. And down to council mailbox. We've got a few different uh, meeting uh, notes there. Is there in a partic any of particular interest we wanted to go through? Councillor Connick, the Affordable Housing Steering Committee was uh, one of yours. Is there anything there that you wanted to go through? No. And how about uh, Police Commission? It's all there. It's all there for us. We can use a motion if. Uh, Councillor Connick? I want to move we adopt the council mailbox as presented. Thank you. All those in favor? Great, thank you. So we have a, uh, a presentation, but I don't think that the individual who's going to be speaking to us this evening is with us right now, so um, we will move into uh, we'll go right into the reading of Bylaw 461, and Director Pichet will start us off on that uh, item, please. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. Uh, tonight before you is third reading for the smoking bylaw. Uh, to remind you, this is a bylaw that encompasses both tobacco and and cannabis. Sorry, we're late. Um, the changes from the first and second reading was um, that was requested by council was changing from a five meter uh, uh, buffer to about a 10 meter buffer in the doorways, windows, and air, take, air intake systems of uh, any buildings. Also, uh, part of the request from council was to uh, have consultation with high schools and the Lacombe Police Service. And uh, with all the high schools that I did discuss with, they didn't have any suggestions or changes to, uh, to recommend. Um, they are looking at their own uh, policies, and much of it is in line with what they're, they're planning already for the schools. Uh, the one change that was requested by the Lacombe Police Service was to define the vaping and the use of uh, vaping products and that they would be able to uh, basically seize or confiscate the uh, paraphernalia from minors only um, if they are caught with vaping products. So that change has been included into the bylaw. And then the other side of it was just the consistency of wording and messages of what is being conveyed to the public by this bylaw. Um, the other area, the last area that uh, required some clarifications was the trails and the sidewalks. And uh, it was to find that the trails did not include sidewalks in this bylaw. I will put to any questions now. Thank you. I'm sure that uh, many of us have had any input from the public on this item, so now is certainly the time to bring up any questions or concerns you have. Councillor Goldson, go ahead. 
Thank you, Mayor Creasy. Uh, I have a real problem with this. That some of the issues, that the 10 meters, uh, especially downtown, if you look at the map, the maps that we have, it basically, you might as well put a sign up on the highway saying this is a non-smoking community, uh, which would be great in, in practice, or, or hopefully a, a dream, that would be great. That's not reality. And I think this is draconian to put in uh, 10 meters downtown and really limits uh, what we can do down there as far as uh, our restaurants and bars. I uh, also have a little bit of a concern with public park, which means public space controlled by the city and set aside as a park to be used for rest, recreation, exercise, pleasure, amusement, and enjoyment. I mean, uh, I saw today, for example, uh, up by the airport, a gentleman walking. Uh, it was city land, obviously. Look, it's a park. And he's walking with his dog, he has a cigarette, he could get a $250 fine and there's nobody within 300 meters of him. I think that's ridiculous that we would be even considering uh, penalizing people that, uh, you know, do, do, does something like that. They're not affecting anybody. Uh, these people are addicted to cigarettes, as I am. Uh, I don't smoke at this time, but I am a smoker. And I think that the, these rules are just way too far. Councillor Connick. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. I think at the end of the day, it'll boil down to discretion. Both of the bylaw officers or the police officer or whoever. So I think in that instance that you cited, yeah, it's an unspoken, but it's. Is, is Bylaw realistic and going to stop and ticket him if he sees him walking his dog and there's nobody around? I don't know, I think it's, I think it's a tough tough thing. Even the five meter, if you look at downtown, is still very tight. So five meter, 10 meter, 20 meter, I don't, at the end of the day, A, it's going to be tough to enforce, and B, I think it's going to be a, and like, it's, like in the instance you cited, I think it's going to be a discretionary thing, really, at the end of the day. I don't think. Um, you know, the whole ticket thing. I think in, in the end of the day, a lot of warnings will probably go out. So I'm not, I'm not too sure. I don't know what the solution is. You can't take it out, right? So I, I yeah. Well, I, I hate for us to pass a bylaw that's not enforceable and that we're not going to allow them to want them to enforce. It'd be nice to have rules. And I mean, this is being put in for uh, basically for cannabis, right? I mean, that was the the reason this came up. Uh, cannabis should be treated like alcohol as far as I'm concerned. Those rules should apply to it. I know some people say, well, how can you tell the difference if they're smoking cannabis? Well, you can't tell the difference if I have a mug, if there's alcohol in it or coffee. So uh, I don't know if there's any difference there. But I think cannabis should be subject to that and not to a smoking bylaw. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. Um, so I too have an issue, a little bit of an issue with um, downtown, in particular with the 10 and the 5. Um, it's it's tough because, of course, I get the, the idea of what we're trying to achieve, but I wonder if there's perhaps some sort of happy medium where we could say that, you know, outside of buildings that are high congregation, like for example, the arena, that's a significant issue where you've got especially at times during games, you've got a lot of people all of a sudden outside at the same time um, smoking and in relative close proximity to the door. So I get the idea that maybe 10 meters is probably quite appropriate in that situation. But I am concerned about sort of um, harming downtown and making it a bit too difficult. At least with the 5 meter, there are some areas that people can, uh, you know, legally congregate. Um, that's the, a, a safe smoking area. Um, so I, I think Perhaps we could look at maybe differentiating. Um, maybe maybe downtown is treated differently. I don't think that would be uh, inappropriate. Um, another issue I, I, I still have holding over from previous discussion on this bylaw is I do appreciate that we've tried to sort of um, explain a little bit the difference between trails and sidewalks, but I still find that problematic because as I was driving around town, I was thinking to myself, okay, now, is that a trail or is that a sidewalk? Because a lot of people think that that's a trail, but it is next to a road. Like for example, the one that um, at the very north end of Sini Trail as you're heading like north. 
um, there's that sort of asphalt pathway. But it is next to a road, and at times it's not very far from the road, and then at other times it's a bit further away. So is that a sidewalk or is that a trail, right? So um, I, I still I still find that quite problematic because I don't I think people want to follow the rules, but I think that it's maybe just not clear enough. <laughs> Um, so just in terms of the first example you'd use for the arena, uh, that it would be 10 meters away. The way the bylaw is written right now is that uh, the arena being a public space, it wouldn't be allowed anywhere on the arena parking lot other than a designated smoking area. Uh, and the five meters downtown, uh, we, aren't really, we aren't able to go less than five meters. So to Councillor Connick's comment of discretion being applied, Certainly the five meter rule has been in place for a number of years um, and enforcement hasn't been problematic either in terms of complaints of lack of enforcement or over enforcement. So the same approach would continue to apply going forward. Thanks for that clarification. Councillor Ross. <coughs> Thank you, Mark. Since this is a question to administration, um, the other municipalities have cigarette dispensers on the walking trails. <coughs> consistent like I think the simplest thing for enforcement is have been consistent but I can see uh council Gullickson's point with individuals walking down the walking trails it's not a density of people around them but in the same sense I think you gotta be proactive to have somewhere to put their cigarette uh, so do other municipalities have uh, cigarette dispensers like dispensers on the walking trails I know there was uh some uh, reference to those uh, in this ballot, but I don't know where it is offhand. Perhaps you can uh, bring that to our attention. Um, Director Pichet will look for a reference to uh, receptacles for cigarettes, perhaps, but um, I, I would suspect that we would find a mix between other municipalities. I'm sure there's examples that do and, and those that don't. We traditionally have, have not, and so Actually, when I heard your example, that was my thinking as well. Even the cigarette butt is the only problem in that situation because I think there typically isn't uh, dispensers. Not dispensers, sorry. Receptacles. Sorry. There's definitely not dispensers. <laughs> so, Dr. Beachy, on 5.9 5 might have been the one I was thinking of, and I don't know if that is necessarily applicable in this instance that's what i was finding too is 5.9 it's more so for the uh the proprietors that they ask people to put their uh, cigarettes out yeah <coughs> councillor jacobson uh question for the cao you had said that we already currently enforce a five meter uh, buffer zone but is that only for public buildings I'm going to ask Director Pichet to look at that. I think it's publicly accessible buildings, not public buildings. But. That's correct. Uh, as per the uh, Tobacco uh, Reduction Act, um, the five meter buffer is set by the province and it's through any public building, which is defined basically as anyone who would have an invitation to come into a building. So if it's a, if it's a store or if it's a public access building, of uh, a government, it would be the same. So, to my follow, uh, to follow up then, um, so the this five meter zone in the downtown area, that's that's what's currently in place right now on the sidewalks. I think that there was a slight limitation to our GIS uh, capability, and so if what you see is actually five meters of all buildings downtown. Um, we weren't able to differentiate between those that are publicly accessible those that are closed to the public, like maybe their uh, residence on a closed main floor or something like that. But I would say 95 or more percent of accuracy, that's what you're, what you're seeing there. Yeah, because my only concern is thinking specifically of the proprietors downtown or, or anywhere, if there's another map that's relevant, that you know, we'll have a difficult time finding designated smoking areas for the patrons. But if it already exists now as per bylaw, it's been Clearly, it isn't that big of an issue, so that's why I was just doing this clarification. So I'm thinking of the, the uglies and the cilantro chives of the world. So yes, and just to be clear, that is in place. 
I would not necessarily say that isn't an issue as in that's not happening. I would say that isn't an issue as in we have not had any complaints about over uh, regulation or under enforcement of this rule. It seems to be at an acceptable level within the community. Councilor Ross, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Casey. I guess I should note this uh, ugly signs and drive leaders, they all have back entrances. <coughs> so these individuals can go to the backs of the businesses that would be, could be used for smoking, I would assume. Because, so the back door, the back entrances is not part of the 10 meters? So I, I believe all these are exempt. Are they not? Or no? Oh, no, my mistake, sorry. So alleys are only exempt from the status that there are portions of the city's trail network where the alley is counted as the trail, and so we've differentiated and said that doesn't count as a trail here. But it still counts as a public entrance, and so you would have that five meter or 10 meter setback. However, those examples that you gave of the existing establishments, with a five meter setback, there would, in theory, be the availability that you could go and stand sort of like in the middle of the alley and smoke legally to an extent. So certainly alley smoking or out the back entrance would be typically seen as sort of more palatable um, and would be, you could have that under the five meter rules. Councillor Hoekstra. Thanks, Mayor Creasy. Um, so on the bylaw, 5.4 states smoking tobacco on city sidewalks is allowed beyond the 10 meter distance of any designated public place blah, and so on. So does this mean that people can smoke tobacco there but not cannabis? Like how is that, that is for sure the case? In, the, in this instance, cannabis is treated like alcohol. So it, where smoking is allowed, it's only tobacco, but not cannabis? Yes, that would be, so if you say came out of your <coughs> private residence and you wanted to stand on the sidewalk and smoke, you could, but you could not stand on the sidewalk and smoke cannabis. Council votes. So <coughs> to me that it just, it, it's getting ridiculous because, for example, Michener Park, you could go up there, you could have a fire, Michener Park, but you can't smoke there, which is insane. It's literally insane to, to do that. You can have a campfire, but you can't have a cigarette. So it doesn't make any sense to me, but I can go back and I can walk down the sidewalk where there's a number of people and have a cigarette. The bylaw, it just doesn't make any sense. It's not enforceable, and what we're doing is creating a bylaw that's unenforceable. And if somebody ever did enforce it, it would be a nightmare for us. Councillor Ross. Thank you, Mary Christa. So if we were to have some method of uh, disposing of the cigarettes on the trails, how many kilometers of trails do we still have? 50? No, I'm just throwing that out because there's going to be a significant cost if you, right? So, do you, I'm just throwing it out there. It's, so I think that I see the, the concern. I think the difficulty is if you say smoking is allowed on trails, then it's almost de facto allowed in parks. And the Cannabis Readiness Committee was very clear to say we don't want consumption of cannabis within parks. So if you want to remove it, I think that would be a separation of tobacco and if you were going to go that way, I would, I would recommend a separation of tobacco and cannabis at that point because you really wouldn't want, the committee really didn't want to see cannabis being consumed on city trails and within the city parks. Councilor Olson. Thank you, Mayor Casey. Well, is cannabis not covered under the liquor bylaw? Just on the smoking bylaw? Uh, the smoking bylaw is the only place that we regulate the consumption of cannabis currently, or that we propose to do so. 
So edibles that you need to have anywhere when they come out? Uh, so currently edibles aren't allowed in Canada, but they would be prohibited through the same bylaw. It speaks to the consumption of cannabis products uh, at anywhere within a public space. So the smoking bottle is taking care of our cannabis control, which, okay. I, I, I just, I don't think it's right. I think it should be covered, covered under the liquor laws and the same laws should apply to cannabis. So I'm hearing that there might be some concern about the distance between the five meter and 10 meter uh, setback. Is anybody thinking of uh, perhaps addressing that or Councillor Hibbs? Thank you, Mayor Creasy. I was thinking actually about proposing an amendment that we would um, somehow, I'm not sure how to word it, but um, change it so that at least the downtown core, and I'm not exactly sure what the, the measurements of that would be, um, would be 5 meter rather than 10 meter. I'd like to see how Council feels about that. Director Pichet, that's, so that's, that's doable to uh, change the downtown core only? Yeah, I think I think we could define a uh, area, geographical area. Okay. Councilor Ross. Thank you, Mary Creasy. And first of all, we asked these businesses like <clears throat> maybe they're strongly against it. Like then it's not an issue. Like we don't slime some shy the establishments themselves. Because that's where we should be most concerned with that if we consult with them and they prefer ten meters over five or one over the other, then rather than getting the scrutiny and the backlash after if we change it. Councillor Hoekstra. Um, thanks, Mayor Creasy. I guess I had a question about that in whether enforcement or whether there's been problems downtown under the current five uh, meter thing because we, we have heard or I have heard from citizens that it is a problem, smoking is a problem downtown. Um, the 5.9 point, no proprietor of a place where smoking is prohibited by this by bylaw shall permit ashtrays to be placed or remain in that place. There are ashtrays outside of businesses now, so they'd be within the five meter zone. Um, if, we're, if we're looking at all along these buildings as being the five meter zone. So um, is it truly been is successful the way it was in the past. I guess that's my concern. I, I, I've heard from people that smoking's a problem, so um, the cannabis use could be a problem unless we address it, like Councillor Gullickson says, that no cannabis in public. So, first off, Councillor Hughes, did you make that motion for the distance portion? I'm sorry, Director P. Did you have something to add? I just wanted to clarify that it is absolutely no cannabis in public. That is section three is uh, no cannabis. Um, section five only speaks to tobacco smoking. So there, there is the differentiation of that no public uh, consumption of, of cannabis is allowed. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. I think it's worth mentioning, because nobody has, um, medical cannabis is, of course, an exception that is treated like tobacco smoke. So when we're talking about um, people having access, now I wouldn't imagine those are a great number of people, but there are people out there that have uh, the medical license to use it. And so they are looking at the smoking um, tobacco uh, rules as their guidelines for where they are able to access their um, you know, medical use or, or not. Um, so again, uh, that's actually another reason that I would support that five meter downtown in particular, um, because there aren't many places that you'd be legally able to use uh, tobacco for sure and, and the medical uh, cannabis, but it does make it a little bit easier. Um, I think I think the 10 meters is just overboard. So do we have any more discussion on the uh, setback distance for the amendment? If not, uh, perhaps Ross, you can read back just what uh, Michelle reads. Thank you, Mary Christy. Uh, Councillor Hibbs uh, had uh, thought about making a motion uh, to, I'm presuming, give the third reading uh, with an amendment or prior to the third reading of motion. I think she was talking about amending 
uh, and that we would somehow change it so that at least the dominant chord would be five meters. <coughs> and five meters. So perhaps if we make that amendment as a separate motion and then deal with the reading later. Okay. So then we are we, we will be voting on to change the ten meter setback in the downtown core to five meters. Is that correct? Everybody's clear? Uh, Councilor Ross? Uh, thank you, Mark Reese. Sorry for asking this and maybe a little late. Uh, is there any chart showing where it currently is five meters? This is it. Yeah. Oh, that's not, that this is the ten. Oh, this is the ten. Oh, I'm sorry. My apologies. Thank you, my apologies. <clears throat> any other concerns between the five meter, ten meter comments? If not, all those in favor? Opposed, if any? Thank you. Go ahead, CAO County. Just in terms, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of clarifying the downtown core area, I would propose that we would go 50 thirds. No, actually, that everything shown on the map that is in front of you would be considered downtown core uh, and subject to a five meter. That, that's agreeable. Okay. Not the rest. interested in moving on to the bylaw itself. Councilor Hibbs. Sorry, not quite. Just I want to revisit the, um, the sidewalks and trails. Um, I, I think I take exception to the idea that if you were to somehow decide to take trails and well, trails, I guess, out, um, that that would somehow mean that parks are, are uh, you know, affected, which I suppose to some minor degree they are, but I do feel that they are separate. Um, so I actually would like to go ahead and make a, an amendment again to exclude um, trails from the um, no smoking. Um, and again, we'll see how um, council feels about that. And that that would be citywide, of course. Specifically, okay. so Councillor Hibbs' motion proposed is uh, that an amendment be made to the bylaw presented uh, to exclude trails from uh, the no smoking portion of the bylaw uh, on a citywide basis. says there's fires in um, Minchin Campground, which is city-owned property. And just like if they're hypothetically in Lower Bowl, Michener, if you put back in day fire pits or something like that for children's birthday parties that historically in the past that were down there, then I think that's very vague just to do walking trails. I think it leaves us vulnerable that the trails are going through the parks and I would I wouldn't be in support of doing trails unless you're going to define more of the parks and so forth. Councillor Hoogstra. Thanks, Mayor Creasy. Okay, so what's the point of this bylaw? Because then are we actually putting anything in place that wasn't covered by the provincial rules as they were? Like, I, I guess I'm, I'm really curious what we've whittled it down to. Um, I think we, if cannabis cannot be consumed in public, why are we spending our time on this? Because I thought that's what precipitated this discussion. Director Pichet. I, I was just going to make a comment regarding the trails in the sense that 
One of the reasons we were including tra trails was specifically around Crown Lake. That has always been a, a point of contention with things, um, especially with the high school right <coughs> there. I just want to make that. Thank you. CEO? Um, I also I just want to, uh, the consumption of cannabis in public is legal. You are proposing under this bylaw to not allow it within the municipal borders of Lacombe in public spaces. So with no regulation, the consumption of cannabis in public spaces on sidewalks and parks, that sort of thing, would be allowed. Councilor Holmes. Thank you, and also um, we don't allow smoke in the trails. We do control the litter, because uh, is that person going to hang on to that cigarette butt for the remaining of their walk? Probably not. So I think that unless you're going to have considerably more garbage receptacles or places to put the cigarette butts, then I think uh, the city's been pretty adamant in trying to move forward as controlling unsightly properties and promote uh, having a clean city. So. Councilor Hibbs. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. Uh, so, of course, littering already is illegal, so if people are dropping cigarette butts, whether it's legal to smoke or not legal to smoke, they're already breaking that bylaw. Um, you know, going back to the trail system around Crana Lake, how far off the trail do they have to step before it's legal? Like, unless you're making that, that whole area um, illegal. Uh, when, when a trail does meet up with a playground, for example, it would seem to me that all of a sudden that has now become a playground, so then you would now have to put that cigarette out or that medical cannabis out. So I think there's a little bit of common sense there. Uh, I just really feel that you're, you know, I'm not a smoker, so I'm, I'm not saying this out of, you know, what I feel that, you know, you're clamping down on me. I just feel that this is just a little bit too much. Um, to tell people that they can go and walk their dog in a nice, you know, natural area, enjoy a cigarette. Ideally, they're grinding it out on their boot and packing out their cigarette, but I don't know. I think that we're just turning into a little bit too much of a nanny state here, and I'm, and I'm not in support of that. So um, I put this amendment forward for that reason. Um, council will vote on it. You can decide to um, go with that. You can decide to vote it down, um, and then we can move on. Councillor Gullickson. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. I, I walked the, the trail in the area that is a real problem, and it, and it is. It's behind the high school. There's a lot of issues there as far as litter and so on. Uh, there's lots of problems in that area. Uh, the kids are being forced farther and farther away from the school, which I understand the school policy. They want the kids to quit, but it it's not reality. They're not all quitting. and. Uh, Sometimes you're better to have them closer than farther away. And that, and I know that from previous experience myself, uh, you may want the smokers to be a little closer than pushing them farther and farther away. But uh, it, it, it is an issue, that, that stretch in there is probably 300 meters, maybe a little longer. The rest of that trail I thought was, I never saw a cigarette butt on the rest of that trail that I walked when I was looking. Uh, but that area is, is bad and uh, certainly it has to be addressed and that's something that the high school has an issue with and it's also our problem because it is on the trails. So do we have any more input um, for removing trails? If not, I'm going to have uh, Our legislative coordinator read back just so we know exactly precisely what we're voting on. So the motion by, by Councillor Hibbs is uh, that an amendment be made to bylaw 461 to exclude trails from the tobacco smoking portion uh, on a citywide basis. That's the way I thought you were fine with that way. Okay. Any more comments on that uh, portion specifically? Councillor Ross. I think equally to uh, enforcement is, just like Councillor Connick mentioned earlier, is discretion of enforcement. Uh, this gives bylaw the tools for the area around Crown Lake, and common sense prevails that if somebody is the sole walker <coughs> on a trail and nobody near him, I would think it would be uh, 
not a good decision to get that individual a ticket, but we'd also give him a lot of the tools to deal with Crown and Lake and to deal with areas that are uh, an issue. If we don't, if we do take out uh, the, tra or the trails, then we don't give bylaw, we don't give enforcement, and we don't give the police service the tools to deal with the areas that are an issue. Thank you for that. Anyone else? All those in favor of removing trails the way that it's sort of known? And all those opposed? Thank you. Consumption by as amended. Okay, as amended. Thank you. Anyone have anything uh, additional? And I'll call the question. All those in favor? All those opposed? So noted. Thank you. So, Mr. Schultz, I appreciate uh, you being delayed here a few moments. We had to move on uh, with the agenda, no but uh, we appreciate uh, you uh, being so patient. Please come on up to the front here. Okay. Uh, I'd like to apologize for uh, being late. We uh, had to uh, pack a bunch of things into our, our van, and uh, we also had a, a pre Apple, where we had my students present to me. So it's an honor to be here. Thank you, Honorable uh, Mayor Creasy and Honorable Members of uh, Council. Thank you to our um, public relations people and our newspapers, and thank you to uh, visitors and uh, our BYS class. Uh, we have uh, five of our original members uh, going to be presenting, and thank you to uh, Ms. Foss, who is our uh, one of our first uh, members of our urban beekeeping program, which you'll hear a little bit more about uh, in our presentation. So uh, with no further ado, I'd like to uh, uh, have my students come forward. Uh, they're gonna tell a little bit of their story and their adventure in this uh, process, and I'm gonna turn it over to them. But thank you again for uh, taking the time to hear our magnificent story um, that has unfolded over the last uh, four years. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I will have uh, all of you use the microphone because uh, we have to keep in mind that we've got uh, viewers online as well, and it makes it difficult to uh, hear, hear without raising that. It makes it clear for the people in the gallery as well. And as long as the red light's on, then you're good to go. Thank you. Okay, I'd just like to say thank you to uh, the council and our honorable mayor for having uh, BYS High School uh, present their BYS project. So this is going to be our quick agenda. So you're going to hear five stories, a little bit of our history, and then a little bit about our urban beekeeping program. And then we'll entertain some questions. And we have uh, some samples for you guys to try. Uh, my students were really busy today making honey candy for the first time. So you guys will have a treat. And we have some uh, kombucha tea as well. Um, hello, so I'm Holden. Um, I'm one of the um, I'm one of the uh, secondary year beekeeping students at our BYS club. Um, I joined beekeeping. I saw it during our LCHS club day at the school, and I thought it would be an interesting experience to learn how bees produce honey, hives, and so on. And it's been a great experience all around. Uh, <laughs> Hi, I'm Quentin. Uh, when I first joined the beekeeping thing, I 
I thought I'd give it a try. All my friends were over and I thought it was really interesting. Uh, I really like helping the environment and uh, uh, I like having fun with my friends, extracting honey from the hives and stuff. And uh, the most, the, <laughs> the part that I find most interesting about the beekeeping program is how the bees make the honey from uh, finding nectar to uh, capping off the honey. Hello, I am Darcy. Um, uh, I joined beekeeping because um, uh, one of my friends um, invited me to join him after school one day and I was doing nothing that day, so I decided to um, uh, tag along. At first I wasn't sure if beekeeping was the right course for me. It seemed a bit uh, like very different from what I was used to at the school at that point. And, um, uh, but it very um, uh, quickly grew on me and I enjoyed it a lot. I enjoy how every student in the club gets is treated equally and like they are acknowledged for what makes them unique and um, uh, it also helped me um, uh, fuel my passion for helping the environment. Hi, my name is Josh and originally I was here for the credits. I, none of these lovely gentlemen uh, introduced me to the course. I wandered in one day and I found a great place to stay and learn. I learned a lot of things. I've learned anything from what a bee is to certain types of diseases and what they can do to a hive. I have been in here for it's my second year. I am not one of the original members. I am the Lane is original. Um, yeah, I've had a great time with the program and learning and growing with it. Josh, I appreciate your uh, honesty and your sense of humor, so thank you. <laughs> I, I am late. I originally started with BY's beekeeping group in its infancy stages. I was there for all of the researching and fundraising for all of our equipment and getting our initial packages of bees. I helped install the first package hive and then came back for a second year to help Darcy, Holden, Quinton, and Josh get up to speed and help manage our hives. I was initially joined the club because it gave me an opportunity to voice what I thought were urgent needs concerning our environment. And I have to admit, the 20 credits that I got from it are a real, real boost towards my diploma. <laughs> this program also allowed me to add another area to consider when I cook, and I look forward to using it in a culinary career. Um, so, EcoVision is a club that was founded by some students in 2010, I believe, or no, 2008? 2007 or 8, yeah. 2007 or 8, and um, the club is an environmental-based club that does projects to help benefit the um, environment, um, help enhance learning of students, and also expand with community growth, and those are also the three pillars of EcoVision. So any project within EcoVision must revolve around those three pillars to be a licensed funded project at the school. <coughs> um, so some of the EcoVision projects that have we have done in the past and are currently doing are our very first one, I was not a part of this one, um, this is the beginning. Um, a group of students came up to Mr. Schultz and said, hey, we want to try and get our school off the grid. So they decided, let's put in some solar panels. So they proceeded to put in 10 solar panels. 30 solar panels, well that's a lot. Um, and now it is, we, we are using the solar energy to power classrooms and other utensils and needs for within the school. The second big project that the EcoVision Club took on was our uh, greenhouse in the garden area. Um, this was a geodesic greenhouse that could house tropical plants and it was all envisioned by a student. 
and then they did research, got community funding and so on, and now it's still sitting out in our garden. And our third and most largest project to date is the uh, EcoVision BeeWise program, which consists of our hives on our property and the um, green certificate program within the course, which gives 20 credits and a great experience. I just want to make a little comment. I uh, just found out this uh, past week that uh, we were voted the greenest school in Canada, greenest high school, so um, these projects are a testimony to that. <sighs> uh, history of BYS. We started about a year ago. Uh, Four years ago. We started we start about four years ago. A group of five students reached, uh, uh, researched, uh, uh, fundraised, and uh, presented to, uh, to city and school board. Uh, the pilot project with the city, it was a pilot project with the city started four hives. Uh, Craig Clark and Stephen Schultz uh, have become the mentors for the program. Uh, Offering 20 credits to the students. Seven new students have joined in the last year, uh, including me. Uh, 15 students have joined this class this year. Uh, now offering courses and beekeeping program uh, for local home residents. If there's any questions, you can interject that between slides. Just kind of wave your hand. We will have a question and answer at the end as well. Uh, here are some unbelievable facts about bees. Um, uh, the first one is um, more about our school than actual bees, but we are the first high school in all of Canada to offer a full-fledged beekeeping program that offers students credits. The next one is um, uh, in a worker bee's lifetime, it will only collect about a uh, tenth of a teaspoon of honey. And um, uh, it takes roughly about 556 workers to um, uh, produce one pound of honey. It's, um, uh, bees have been around for about 30 million years. That's a pretty long time for That's that a pound of honey. Mm -hmm. For anyone who needs a visual of a pound of honey, it is being passed around. Um, uh, all worker bees are in fact female bees, and any male bees get kicked out during the fall, right before winter. Um, uh, bees can fly, fly from a five, five kilometer radius from the hive. It, it, in an average trip, trip um, uh, bees will stop and search any, and pollinate anywhere from 50 to 100 flowers before returning to the hive. Um, uh, the bee's brain is uh, actually more of an oval shape, and it's, it's different from ours in that perspective way. Um, uh, in, in bees can communicate by um, uh, doing little different dances. With, by shaking their um, uh, legs and bodies, they can, and going in how big of circles, they, they can direct other bees to um, uh, good patches of, like, example, canola, clover, they can tell other bees what's, what is where and where to get it and how far away it is. And um, uh, they can also exchange stomach contents to let, give that same information. And um, uh, queens have stingers um, uh, don't have barbs and don't have venom. Urban beekeeping. Um, in partnership with City Lacombe, we had a project where we had uh, adults and anybody who wanted to have a bee a beehive on the property come to us and learn how to become a beekeeper the right way instead of doing it by themselves, which is a very similar idea. Uh, that was in last year. So this year, we're going to uh, do workshops again and provide. So good. Yes, last year we were doing uh, <laughs> workshops and mentorships and leases to anybody who needed any uh, help or information about Hive and what to do. Um, we also had, we gave away, didn't give away, but bee suits and bee equipment along with bee books. Yeah. So we 
in the process. So Arlene, Arlene's still here. She's uh, our first resident of Lacombe to actually have uh, bees on her own property. Uh, thank you for being willing to take that risk and so acknowledge Arlene. Thank you. as well and the bees are doing very well. <laughs> so what do you need to do to become a urban beekeeper in the cone? First you need to take a BeeWise beekeeping course and get a certificate through our club and which is I'm pretty sure signed off by the city council. It's not signed off by city council. City council's given us permission, so it's yeah. a little technicality there. Number two, join the Red Deer Beekeeping Asso Association and find a BeeWise mentor. Number three, register with the Alberta Apiculturist. Four, get a premises identification number or PID. Five, purchase or lease from BYC your equipment, which is listed in the next slide. And number six, order a package of bees from PV Mart or a nucleus of bees from Creek, uh, Lacombe Honey Creek Clark or us? Through the school here or Lacombe Honey. So just a little note, the, the model we're following is the same model that the City of Calgary follows, and so that's the recommendation that we took from uh, bylaw officers that we talked to, and we did a lot of research, and so that's the reason why we're following this model. So some of the basic equipment you will need to be an urban beekeeper is a gloves and a bee suit, so first off you don't get stung by the bees. Um, another thing you can, that you should probably have is a hive tool, which we will pass around an example of. And it's basically a small little crowbar looking tool that you can use to separate the frames um, in, within your bee hives to actually access your honey. You can also use it to pull apart frames, separate things, and so on. Um, another thing you'll need is a smoker. And uh, we aren't talking like a cigarette smoker or anything. It is a... <laughs> the bylaws. <laughs> Please don't give us a ticket. Too close. So the smoker is used to um, actually blow smoke within the hive. So you can mask the pheromones that the bees give off to alert when there is danger within the hive. Um, another thing you can have is a bee brush, which when you are extracting your honey or just checking your frames, you can use the brush to brush the bees off of your um, frames and such which are within the boxes. And then um, another essential tool you can have is a bee feeder. And it's basically a black rectangle that you slide within your hive that has a uh, form of sugar water that your bees can live off of if they run out of honey or they can use over the winter for food storage. I'd like to give a shout out to uh, PV Mart. PV Mart has been a very um, incredible business to work with. They uh, donated uh, enough suits for a whole class and also uh, helped us uh, buy our equipment at a reduced price. So thank you to PV Mart. Just a shout out to them. Um, so we're going to talk about some of the hives we've gotten. We have eight hives right now. Uh, First one I'm going to talk about is the Malibus hive, Longest from Langstroth hive. Uh, Malibus uh, was first made May 15th, uh, 2017. Uh, it's a penhold nucleus with Hawaiian heritage. Uh, it's been superseded twice, named after the first four students, so now first five. Uh, Naomi, Avi, Blair, Lane, and Shams. Lane, right there. <laughs> One of the original five. <coughs> um, uh, our second hive is called um, uh, Chippendale. It was uh, it was also um, uh, made alongside of Nelbs uh, and like I can't get the words out of my mouth. <laughs> but um, uh, pr first um, uh, 
created on um, uh, May 15, 2017, alongside Nalapsama. It's also a penhold nucleus with, well, its queen is also um, uh, Hawaiian descent, and it, this has also um, uh, superseded twice. Um, uh, you may be wondering why we call it Chippendale. You might not be able to see it in the picture, but in the top right corner, it, there's a chip out of the it, and so we got the name Chippendale. And what is superseded? What do you mean when you say superseded twice? Um, uh, superseding is um, uh, when um, uh, the, the bees believe their queen is not performing up to um, uh, the standards that she should, so they um, uh, often get rid of her and um, uh, start um, uh, forming, raising new queens. <laughs> sort of like politics, you know. <laughs> You're out. <laughs> Um, the Aussie Hive, which is my favorite and the best one. Um, the Aussie Hive is a Langstrumpf Hive, and for those who don't know, a Langstrumpf Hive is a type of hive which we specifically use. Um, it was made in April 30th, 2017, and the queen came from Australian descent, actually, and it had the best harvest of the year with 60 kilograms. Uh, the Aussie queen was transferred to a hive called Takeover, uh, oh, no, yeah, to Takeover, and a new queen was raised, so it was split. So you might be asking, why do we have to get our queens from Australia? Well, there's been a ban from any queens from other provinces and also from the US because of disease. So you can only get your queens locally or you uh, bring them in from um, island countries like Australia, New Zealand, or Hawaii. So Steve, I'm just curious, how, how many times a year do you harvest honey to get 60 kilograms out of one hive? Like you, you can harvest on a continual basis. We have chosen at our school to, because uh, students come back in September, so the students can be an uh, integral part of the harvest. We harvest once uh, a year. This year, we're going to have uh, close to 600 pounds of honey from our eight hives. Our next hive is the Foamy Langstroth Hive. We split this one from Nelves on May 30th, 2018. So a split is where you take bees from one hive, put them in a different box, and put a new queen in. This queen, is her breed is called the Saskatriaz. It's a Alcatraz queen that's been bred in Saskatchewan. <laughs> Alcatraz, uh, California. So the uh, takeover hive, as mentioned before, was a accidental split with the um, Aussie hive. So we wanted to make another split and we wanted to expect that hive to supersede but we accidentally put the queen within this new hive, so we called it the takeover hive because the Aussie queen sort of took over this new hive. So um, this was our first split that um, I performed and many other students did. Um, and it was May 25th, um, the hive started to grow up and it took over and this is a bit of an outdated picture, so are most of them. Um, last time I was out there, um, they were pretty tall, so. Seven feet. Yeah, seven feet tall was the highest hive we had. There can only be one queen, so we accidentally put two queens together, and so they fought to the death. <laughs> Next slide is missing, so you can just talk about our swarms. Do you remember about our swarms? We've caught three swarms this summer. Yeah. Okay. So we've caught like three swarms this, this summer. We don't have any names for the hives that they've turned to yet, but. Uh, so what is a swarm? Just so they know what a swarm is. So when the bees aren't happy with the conditions in the hive, they may leave the hive and find somewhere else to stay. Like they'll all just attach themselves to a tree branch or something, which is where I was for the one storm that I was there for. They'll actually split the hive in half. It's like a natural way of reproducing. When a beehive swarms, it's actually the, the time of the bee's life when it's the least harmful. 
because they gouge themselves with honey because they're going to go explore a new site and they can't sting when their bellies are full of honey. So you can actually put your hand right into a swarm and you won't get stung. So we did a lot of research and a lot of you might be wondering, you know, what about the uh, duty of care that we have to uphold and what about, you know, being stung and uh, we did our research and only two fatal deaths in Canada, the whole country of Canada a year. So um, more people die from wasps or other insects stings. These are the least likelihood of an insect to be um, hurt by. Uh, when a bee stings you, it uh, dies, it loses a stinger and its guts get pulled out. So it's the ultimate sacrifice. So that's another thing to remember when a a wasp can sting you millions of times and still live to tell the story. All right, next. I don't know if we can show any of these videos, and we might be running out of time, but we have a series of videos that you guys can watch. Um, you guys all have this uh, reproduction or this PowerPoint on your thing. So this is just some of our experiences that we have had with our beekeeping. So. Is that okay? I don't know how to activate the, the video anyway. Do you want to activate the second video? Who's? Yeah. We'll listen to one video. I think that uh, Ross had tried to act those, those before and wasn't having a bunch of luck, but if we're able to get one to work. Just try the one. It's only 40 seconds long. So Darcy, what's happening here? We've just re queen What does that mean? Um, uh, in this video, I, we just requeened, where we um, uh, took one of another Saskatraz in this case, and um, uh, gave it to a hive that had lost their queen. So I believe in this case it was the Aussie hive that had lost the queen during the um, uh, transfer to take over. And um, uh, in this video, it's just us doing a little inspection, pointing out the um, uh, all the brood, which is the all the um, uh, cap stuff you may see. You've got a bee in there still, though. I'm looking at candy cubes. So the little cage, can you tell what the little cage is? Um, the little cage you so we can, can remove see the now, candy? right there, the little Two. wooden cage. The cage. That's, uh, That's a queen souvenir. cage. That's um, uh, what, when queen, you order a uh, nucleus of bees or a package of bees, um, uh, the yeah. queen will always be separated from the other bees in one of those cages. Right. That way you don't have to spend uh, your time so looking for eh? a big ball of mass. Nicely bees. capped, very uniform. So why do you put the queen in a cage? Why don't we just put the queen into the hive? What do the other bees have to no do? Queens, and, um, uh, another reason we put the queen into a cage is um, uh, since if the um, uh, bees um, uh, detect her pheromone and they are used to the old queen's pheromone, they'll uh, try to kill her because she, they may think she's trying to invade their hive. Therefore, the cage gives them a bit of separation so they can um, uh, grow used to the new pheromone. So we have some thank yous, and then uh, we'll have some questions and answers. A lot of thank yous. Um, thank you to you guys for listening to us, ramble on for a few minutes. Thank you to the audience, and everyone else listening. Uh, thank you to the City of Lacombe for giving us permission for the U.S. project. Permission, of course. Uh, thank you to the schools for letting us uh, have the hives on the school on the school grounds. Uh, thank you to Schultz and Craig Clark for helping mentoring us throughout the years. Um, another big mentors being Arlene, uh, the Hills, Carmen, and Tara. The original five students who took upon themselves to go out and make this happen. The magnificent seven being. Holden, Quentin, Darcy, myself, Emily, Emma, and Sarah. And our sponsors being Piedmart, Whole Kids Foundation, Emerald Foundation, Home Hardware, and the County of Lacombe. And our businesses are interactions with our local businesses being Sancho and Chives, Order and Pestro Pharmacy, uh, Health Fitters, oh, Health Fit, yeah, Fitters, uh, and Sweet Phones. Thank you so much. So this is very fitting, Lane's the original student, uh, one of the original five. So if you have some questions and he can't answer them, and nobody can, so uh, <coughs> fire away. We just really are very, very sincerely grateful for 
Um, the city of Lacombe has always been one of our partners and worked hand in hand. Uh, when we got the greenhouse, um, you know, I'd never applied for a permit before and I, I went to the office ladies and they said, oh, you have to fill out this in this form and I just was overwhelmed and, and people came and alongside of us and helped us through all the steps of the process and same thing with this uh, BYS project. So I'm very, very grateful for this uh, preceding city council and this uh, city council for their, their support. Um, Matthew, you were uh, privileged to come out and uh, inspect the bees and held a you know a can of, of drink and you know not like the wasp you know the bees were doing their own thing and there was no no harm. So any questions, any comments, any thoughts from council? I know this is a lot of information and we really felt you guys needed to know about our project and. And I think that uh, Councillor Ross has a question for you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, just maybe some sources of uh, grants that are might be available for you. Yeah, British government allots so much money to each uh, branch of agriculture, you could say, like dairy, poultry, turkeys, and so forth. And all of them associations then uh, provide funds for, for example, uh, festivals and so forth to promote their product. So that might be a source for yourself to go to the upper deck culture through that government. Because I know, honey, obviously has their own industry. Just I used to farm, so I know every association has their own directors and their own boards, and they're very aggressive to promoting their products. Uh, another one through the federal government is the uh, to the environmental farm plan. The federal government stated a lot of uh, has a lot of funds for updates of technology and grants, and in this case which you're promoting that industry, so yeah. uh, I think there's opportunities for that just to yeah. so, and support you in all your efforts. So congratulations. Appreciate that. Thank you. So I don't know, I'm not sure Lane's answer, but it might have been Holman brought it up, was this the waggle dance. Did I understand that, that bees communicate to tell bees that are in the hive where, where are the good spots to go for a nectar are? Is that? Yep, and Darcy was uh, in charge of that slide, but uh, Lane can probably tell you about that. It's actually absolutely fascinating to watch, but go ahead, Lane. So bees, once you're about a football field away, so a hundred yards, bees can tell within five feet through their waggle dance where a source of pollen is. Absolutely amazing. Here, here, I thought I was hearing things, but that's what he said. Okay, thank you. That's very, that's quite amazing and very interesting. Thank you, uh, Councilor Park. So you, you say you're up to seven hives now. What, what's, what's the limit? Like, I mean, I'm assuming you need, you need the product at the end of the day too. Like, I, I have a raspberry bush and a cherry tree that does very well. Maybe in part because of your bees, but what's, what's the capacity there? So we again have done a lot of research. And uh, um, the city of Calgary kind of has set a precedent of uh, 25 sites within a, a community. So uh, you know, I don't know if that translates into Lacombe having one or two or three communities the size of communities in Calgary. Uh, so that's the model that we're going with. So we're going to uh, next year have 25 property sites. Right now we have one in Lacombe, and that's our liens. And we had uh, five or six take the course, but wanted to wait another year just to get more knowledge and information under their belt. Um, so we're going to limit it to 25, um, and then we're going to give those addresses to the bylaw officers. And they're also the city of Lacombe is going to create a, a map so that then we can um, do a little bit of uh, action research and find out you know, how, which hives thrived, which ones did not, was there an overpopulation in a certain area of town. Um, so we're try, gonna try to see you know, if the city of Lacombe, well, I'm pretty, pretty confident with that model that we can sustain 25 properties and each property can have two hives. Yeah. So I'm just curious from, from the beekeeper that you have here with us. <coughs> I, I missed your name. Arlene. Arlene. Hey, I'm just curious from, from your perspective, how has the reception been from your uh, neighbors? Um, the neighbors to the side of me um, are both very happy. Um, they were thinking or were hoping, wanting that they could be keep at some point in their lifetime too. 
Um, the neighbors behind me, I have not heard anything from them. I don't know that they're even aware. Interesting. So in our, in our workshop, we make sure that we go through all the um, regulations that are in Alberta. So we follow the, the apiculturalist recommendations. We also make sure that uh, the people that have hives know where to locate their hives. Um, also know how to take care of the hives. A uh, hive that's taken care of will, most people won't even recognize that you have a hive in your, in your, on your property. It's, they're that un, in a, unintrusive. In fact, uh, I would say that 50% of the students right now at the comp don't know that we have hives. They think, they know we have a beekeeping program, but they do not know we have hives. And their picnic tables are literally 100 yards away from the hives and they do not know we have hives. We actually went and talked to a bunch of students and asked them, do you know there's hives on this property? And we found out 50% of them do not even know that we had hives. We only have nine. Dr. Jacobson. Uh, just a couple things. So uh, how many of those 25 spots do you have filled right now? We have one filled and five or six in line. In lieu. Okay, so if people are interested, what's the best way they contact you directly? Contact them directly to the high school. Yeah. Um, we've got a website as well, uh, www.lchsecovision.weebly.com. But emailing me and I will. What's really cool about our program is that, um, I'm glad Lane's here, is that our students will actually mentor the beekeepers every step of the process. And Lane, you had the privilege of doing that this summer, so you want to talk a little bit about that? So I was volunteered, voluntold to help out one of our course takers to help set up his hive, and then he allowed me to come and inspect with him when he inspected, just to give uh, confidence and to give uh, outside perspective on what his bees were doing. Great, so I have actually been seeing the praise of this program for the last year in council here. I've been, I haven't obviously met any of you young gentlemen, but um, uh, Steve here, I've been hearing about this for the last uh, at least eight months at Echo. And uh, you all um, certainly more than um, exceed his uh, description of, of you all, so congratulations for that. And I just want to also mention, um, it's not a living point out here, but uh, Mr. Schultz here has certainly gone far above and beyond in getting this program not only set up, but accredited. And um, it's not even remotely done justice to what he's done to get this off the ground. And not only himself, but this entire program is an incredible asset to our community. And I think we're <coughs> extraordinarily well on us that you guys are doing this. So thank you very much. Thank you. Just, just real quick, I know, I know that the candy. What, what is this that I'm drinking? <laughs> so that's a value-added product. So I'm really challenging my students to think outside the box. I'm all constantly doing that, and uh, so that's kombucha tea, mm -hmm. and it's made with honey instead of sugar. So it's a value-added product from our honey, and it, uh, it's actually green tea and honey fermented with a scoby, so it won't taste like green tea or honey after it's been fermented. It's a probiotic, so it's healthy, it's non-alcoholic, and it's sugar-free. So if you're a diabetic, you're welcome to drink it, and if you're an alcoholic, uh, you're welcome to drink it as well. That's <laughs> <laughs> Hibbs. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. So I guess, first of all, I'd like to say, you know, thank you for your presentation. It can be pretty hard to get in front of, you know, maybe very formal, you know, stern looking group and we're not of course but uh, you know thank you so much you did fantastic i had the the good luck of actually chatting with darcy a little while ago when you were set up at um, i think it was a wednesday market and so we had a good chat about the program and about some of the stuff you're doing and so that was that was pretty awesome i really appreciated that so it really gave me a, a good inside view and i and i brought home some of the tea and really quite enjoyed it over the course of a few days um i was just curious um you know you were mentioning business model and i think this is fascinating because not only are you teaching them um, something sharing with them something that's agricultural, right? It, it's uh, you know natural and good for the environment, but there's also the business model side of things. So so it's kind of um, you know uh, 
cross course type of um, you know uh, material that you're doing so like beyond just what you're doing already like is there use of maybe the wax like I used to know a beekeeper once upon a time when I was young and it was my friend's father and he had a number of hives in the backyard it was an urban situation and he would um, you know do amazing things with wax and so that you know that's another area oh so we got maybe some ideas there and then also um, you know we're talking about setting up different places in the city and I, I hope that this presentation um, gives a lot more uh, you know, uh, information out to, to residents to go, hey, maybe I'd like to be a part of that. But also the county, because I know um, a lot of farmers, for example, you think that would be quite interested in having hives set up on their property as well, because of course that would benefit, um, you know, their, their growing a crop and whatnot. So I'm just curious as to, you know, what your kind of future plans are. But let's talk about wax first. That sounds like that would be interesting. So I have uh, three other students here that are in the third BYS, uh, four actually, sorry. There are five. Oh, five. There's five students. Kids, stand up. And so this is my present class. And they're the lucky because uh, they get to take this class during class hours. So the first 12 I had to do it after school. So that's uh, one privilege they get. But they are already um, percolating ideas. Um, so one of the ideas was to, for the first time, we're going to actually take the wax. and. Uh, I'm going to use the wax, but um, Cody is, you know, percolating a few ideas. So he and uh, one of his other classmates that's not here, um, and with the help of these guys uh, today and uh, last Wednesday, um, what did you do? And you guys got a, a treat already, but what are you planning to do with that? And uh, you know, just talk a little bit about your experience. Well, I didn't know. I was actually so what do we do last Wednesday? Do this. Uh, we did last Wednesday. We were making candies that you just ate, and uh, it was a kind of a complete failure. But we tried again today, and it was, went very well. I spent most of my class time along with another class time that he got me late for, <laughs> and um, so yeah, we make candies, and we are promoting it with our businesses and. Making it like yeah. so, so seventy five of those candies gets filled into one of those one kilogram tubs and what are you gonna sell them for? Uh, we're going to sell them for ten bucks. Yeah. yeah. So it just value add. Um, so I had a business student come in um, today and he is uh, gonna help us with our, our business model. We're also partnering with Berman University. And one of their business professors is uh, working alongside with us. Uh, he's also on the Echo Board. Uh, David Jeffries is his name. And he uh, comes in every Friday now um, and teaches my current beekeeping students how to create a business plan. And then each of the, my uh, beekeeping students that desires will uh, create a value-added product. So uh, wax is going to be one. Um, we're also going to uh, invest on a new hive that was invented in Australia. We just contacted the company. It's called the Flow Hive. It, um, it's a really brilliant idea. Um, at first, we thought that um, the cold climate would affect our, our hive, but uh, we've found differently. Um, so the Flow Hive has um, a plastic cone, and you just turn a handle, and the honey comes out, and you don't have to harvest honey like traditionally you've had to do. And so we are partnering with this uh, new company and then we'll be maybe their uh, suppliers for, uh, for Alberta because they're currently not in Alberta. Well, Steve, we certainly uh, do thank you and, and your uh, students for getting here, here tonight. We've learned an awful lot about beekeeping and we appreciate it. Uh, it's obvious to see your passion about uh, uh, teaching and uh, it's great to have your students here so thank you very much for coming out thank you um, that's what just say thank you on behalf of anybody want to say thank you okay. um, so on behalf of uh, the EcoVision BYS group at LCHS I would like to thank you for your time and allowing us to come here and present on our great project that you let us start and uh, I'd just like to thank you for your time and everything else. Thank you.
and um, all of our products that we did make and you tasted today. If you did enjoy them, we do sell them at the school. So if you would like to swing on by um, during or after school hours, I, or you can email Mr. Schultz and get in contact with him. And you can be able to purchase our honey, the candies, the kombucha, and herbs as well that we grow in our garden. So. Thank you. Thank you. everybody for coming and supporting us. <laughs> Appreciate that. Perfect. That's indeed a ride back to Or you ride here. Perhaps I'll have uh, the manager of Western come up and uh, introduce a couple of them to get their goodies uh, packed up and have you work into my 360 or 460, please. Did anyone in the audience want to try some of our honey candy? Okay, good. Thank you for coming again. Thank you. 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 Sounds like good things come from Australia, so... <laughs> right on, mate! <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and so, uh, before you, you have Bylaw 460, which is the borrowing bylaw for the Henners Storm Pond Outlet Project. Uh, administration is recommending that we uh, get first reading at Bylaw 460. So just to outline, um, in the 2018 team capital budget, the city approved the project that has allowed for development around the Henners Pond area. In order to facilitate this development, uh, the stormwater um, outlet has to be constructed. This project was presented at the regular council meeting on March 26, 2018. The bylaw has been drafted using Alberta capital financing, um, but it doesn't allow for local borrowing through the local financial institution. As with all borrowing bylaws, we'll have to go a 15-day um, uh, petition period um, where the voters for Lacombe can uh, bring forth a, a valid petition. Once again, with this borrowing bylaw, our administration will provide uh, the option for public feedback on the City of Lacombe's borrowing page located at uh, Lacombe forward slash borrowing, and comments collected through this uh, medium will be presented prior to second and third reading. The total borrowing for this bylaw is 1.82 million and it will be carried both interest and principal payments. Um, the annual debt servicing cost is around $107,000 at um, just over 3% of 25 years amortization. I would like to uh, give it to Director Thompson um, just to give you a broader perspective on the implications of just this borrowing for the for the development around the Henners um, that they'll will be subsequent borrowing over and above this for future phases of tennis. Uh, thank you, uh, um, City Manager DeBresser. The, um, just wanted to, uh, two comments. Um, the value that's being um, uh, we're proposing that Council proceed with, uh, $1.8 million, that is the, uh, the current budgeted value for this project. Um, our uh, engineering uh, estimates to date um, do confirm that we will be we anticipate being underneath under that budget, um, and so based on the actual value of the project when we tender it, as well as the final land uh, acquisition costs, we will borrow the, that that actual value. And so the this bylaw would authorize an offset limit. We would only borrow what we needed for this project. Uh, and then the second uh, point we wanted to make was while this borrowing does. Um, does allow or facilitate the construction of the outlet from Henders, uh, Henders Pond. Um, that um, opens up development for only a, a portion of the Karras Village um, Seniors um, Complex well, east of Henders. The, there is a need for a sanitary sewer lift station, which 
um, Manager DeBresser has, uh, has highlighted here, um, in order to facilitate further development beyond um, what phase 1A um, of the Karis Village. So this, this certainly will, well, it's one step in terms of opening up the north area for development. There is still a lift station, sanitary sewer lift station that is required and identified in the city's current off-site levy. Director Cops, did you have any indication of uh, the time frame in which those additional infrastructure items will be required in order to uh, enable the carriage group to continue building? Beyond Phase 1A, uh, well, Phase 1A certainly uh, Alberta Environment has, has given the approval for them to proceed with their development concurrent to the construction of this outlet. Because right now, uh, or at least initially, uh, if Council recalls, Alberta Environment had indicated that there's, since there's no adequate outlet from Henry's Pond, then no development can occur that drains into Henry's Pond. And so, uh, in speaking with Alberta Environment, they have confirmed that we are able to, uh, Phase 1A of Karis Village is allowed to proceed uh, while we are working through the approvals process for this outlet. Uh, in terms of the, the timing of development to when that lift station would be required, it certainly would be required at the very next the next stage of development, either of Karis Village beyond 1A, or any residential or commercial development around Henner's Pond. So it's really development driven in terms of when that would that would occur. So it's so difficult for us to nail down the date. Um, in terms of, I guess, the status on the project right now, still going through the approvals process. We did have a information uh, session uh, a few weeks back to. Uh, give members of the public an opportunity to uh, learn about the project. And so uh, as we're going through that, that, that process, we will uh, be able to uh, finalize the design and, uh, and tender the project we, and get some final construction numbers. We anticipate doing that either December or January, but it really depends on that, you know, the, uh, the approvals process to, uh, to drive that schedule. I appreciate that information. Just without actually looking back in the, in the uh, Karis development plans, uh, 1A uh, included several uh, duplex units and one multi-story complex, did it not? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so is it? It's, it's, really, it's based more on topography than anything. Right. Okay, thank you. Councilor Ross. Thank you, Mayor Kuse. I was just gonna make a motion that Council get first reading to Bala 460 as presented. My apologies, sorry. Thank you for that. Any additional comments? Uh, Councillor Hoopstra, go ahead. Um, I just, for, oh, thank you, Mayor Creasy, for those of us who may not have be all up to speed, this one under issue analysis, it says this borrowing is necessary to facilitate the off-site levy funded stormwater infrastructure. How is this a different kind of borrowing? Like, what does that mean, off-site levy funded? So it means that ultimately the town expects to get paid back as development occurs. Um, so you're actually just, you're front-ending this, and as those 300, I think it's about 300 acres up there uh, in Henners, is that right? Yeah. Uh, as that develops, we will recover on a uh, per acre basis or per hectare basis the cost that we put into it. Uh, so, and actually with our model now, the financing as well. So it, it is different in that over time you expect to recover from a third party, whereas typical infrastructure just built for the city, of course, the only, it's only for the taxpayer. Good with that clarification? Yes. All right. And I think we can uh, insert city and town too. <laughs> Just no problem. Uh, seeing no one else, I'll uh, call the question for first reading. All those in favor? Unanimous, thank you. And while you're up here, might as well uh, move into my lot 462. So 
Bylaw 462 and uh, as well as the C6 zoning item that uh, comes after it are both uh, intended to help council or allow council to meet the terms of the purchase sales agreement. So the money is in place and the, the zoning is in place um, for the investment that is contemplated in this area. Uh, if the full terms of the agreement are not met, you don't have to borrow this money. You, there is no obligation to, to go ahead with that. Uh, so it really just provides the means to what you've contemplated. This is not an actual guarantee of going ahead. That's our show. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. Um, so is this borrowing by law an off-site levy funded borrowing? It is not only the infrastructure projects that are shown in bylaw 387, which is our off-site levy uh, bylaw, are what we would call off-site levy projects. This is this does not appear in that bylaw. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. So um, this borrowing bylaw, then, in my in discussions with the public, yeah, it has been equated to be the same as doing what we're doing in the north end, and so it is not. That is what I'm getting the clear sense of. So is this something that we like? We're talking now about facilitating the land transactions. That's correct, right? Um. So. I just want to question whether this is something that we should do as a municipal government. Um, development generally triggers when we look, go into a borrowing situation. We, we do not have any promise of development attached to this borrowing bylaw. Um, we are just trying to secure a major Canadian retailer, it says here, and facilitate the transfer of lands, but there's no promise of actual development on, well there's a promise but there's not nothing actually in place and so I question whether we should be doing this as a municipal government. Then secondly, I guess I would like clarification under issue analysis with this one as well. Um, it says here, i got to move my note, the city has taken steps to ensure accountability by requiring its financial investment to be returned if the project does not commence. Who returns that financial investment? Is it the seller or the buyer? Like, does the, do our citizens get to know some of the details about how we are gonna assure that? What is the security we have in place? What are the steps we can take to ensure that this is an okay situation to be entering in? Uh, so I'll try and answer the questions maybe in backwards, and so tell me if I've missed one. Um, what's, what's the mechanism of the assurance? Uh, it is a charge against the property itself that will be registered as a caveat on title. Where does the city get the money back and how do uh, citizens find that out? There is a copy that's available for public review here at City Hall that uh, we have had citizens come in and review. So certainly that's available to anyone should they wish to. Uh, who are we getting the money back from? The entity that we sell the land to. So that would be um, contemplated as uh, the developer himself in this in this case. And the question was. Thank you. Uh, it was answered like this is not an offsite levy type borrowing. Uh, correct. This is not an offsite levy uh, borrowing. It is also fundamentally different in that in the Henner's Outlet project, uh, the city is creating owned hard infrastructure that is providing a service. The investment here is an economic development activity that does not create any hard asset in and of itself. But in the case of the offset levy, if the city has a choice whether they do that stormwater pond or not, the city could have told the developer you're responsible for it. Could, they, could we not? 
like we are to assist them with the CARES development. We're taking the initiative to for further the initial stages of the project back. I, I, I think it would be an interesting legal exercise to see whether the city could just tell the developer you're responsible for that. Given that you have an adopted bylaw that says the city will do it through this offsite levy mechanism, I think there would be a, a case to be made that someone could come and say, well, you know, maybe I am going to do it initially, pay for it, but you're going to have to collect the money for me and, and give it back. Or So there, there is a mechanism there. The city does have the ability of, like, I, I guess, quite a bit of discretion about whether or not they proceed. Certainly there's no obligation that the city proceed with that, with that uh, outlet. It's seen as facilitation of development, that it's going to open up that Henner's area. Um, I'm not sure that the city could just say it's up to you, fund it on your own to the developer. Councilor mm -hmm. Hibbs. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. I think it's also important that we remember that, at least this is my understanding, that um, this outlet does not only benefit, if you want to use that word, um, Karis Village, right? It's, it's no further development can happen in that north end on that side until that outlet is put in place. So we would be essentially hamstringing any further development at all at, at that end. So I think that's important. It's, this isn't for the benefit of um, a single developer. It, it is for the whole um, north end on that side. Sorry, there was one other comment that you made that I wanted to uh, make a comment on was the what assurance does there's no actual guarantee that something will happen. The city does have an assurance within the purchase sales agreement that if this investment were to occur, uh, something would happen. That something is a construction of a retail store at at least 25,000 square feet. There is no guarantee of any specific retailer or particular entity, it is only to a certain size of store at that site. Councilor Ross. Uh, thank you, Mayor Greasy. I would like to make a motion that Council <coughs> second reading to Bob 462 as presented. Thank you, Councilor Oakshire. Um, thanks, Mayor Creasy. Just to follow up then, um, when we do development on the north with the outlet or on the west side, that is to benefit the whole development. To benefit the whole development on the north. This borrowing bylaw is not that sort of thing. Am I is that correct? This is only to benefit the one development, the one specific, what do you say, what did you say, $25 million building on is that what you said? Twenty five dollars no, twenty-five thousand square foot. Feet. Okay. But it's only to benefit that. This is this borrowing bylaw is not to benefit the whole development. I think that citizens have to be very clear of what this borrowing bylaw is doing. Councilor Gibbs. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor Creasy. Um, I, I guess I just really want to, before we go ahead and, and you know do our vote on this uh, on this motion, just be really clear that um, this motion is very unique, the situation is very unique, despite what I've heard, no it's not, but it really is, because we're treating taxpayers as reluctant in investors with half of the info. They're, they're not given the info that we have, and we're, we're asking them to just trust us, and I don't think that's appropriate. Public dollars should be for public services, that's roads, recreational services, public transportation, those types of things. Um, that's not to say that I don't support more shopping in this community. Um, many many people have been very clear that they do, and, and I certainly do, and, and I think that this would probably be a, a great project. It's just a matter of how we're making this happen. I, I do support the idea of incentives. It's just the idea here has gone too far. The scope is too large. Um, you know, we, we can't point to a criteria. This council cannot explain to the taxpayer, well, we went we're going down this road because X, Y, Z. We've we've shown no no criteria other to, than to say, you know, residents wanted shopping and we're going to give it to you. Um, and so, how do we justify this special circumstance? How do we now turn around and say to another business, well, well, we did it there, but we're not going to do it for you. Sorry. And then, you know, we talked about assurances, and so we do have an insurance uh, assurance that um, we'll get our money back if uh, construction doesn't commence. 
in, th in three years, but there's no assurances beyond that. We know that businesses start and then they whatever decide to fold up their tent for any number of reasons, so there's, there's really no guarantee. Now I, I think that the chances of that is relatively minor, but that's what people do when they make business decisions. They weigh the risks and they decide whether it's a good investment. And, and I think that we're putting uh, residents in a situation where uh, they don't have the full information and you know we're making a decision on their behalf um, you know on, on the risk factor here and again I'll just go back that this is not our money this is their money and and I'm I'm not okay with it so I will be voting against this Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Mayor Creasy. I also have issue with that this is called an investment, and I was talking about this at the Chamber, and, and traditionally when you invest your money in something, you are guaranteed to have a return. And and I think it's really important that, that citizens realize, now I'm not going to find the statement, but, but this is just, this is $750,000 that facilitates a land purchase transaction. There, the city does not have anything after this is done. An investment produces something or we would have purchased an asset as we were discussing earlier. We, when we put in infrastructure in the city that's still assets that we can claim, we have no claim after this $750,000 leaves the city's coffers other than a promise. And, and I think that citizens are very concerned that we're investing $750,000 in a promise rather than in, in an actual item and an actual development. Um, I did want to speak to a couple of the comments that came through on the internet. One person said, this could sh potentially bring income in for the city which would ultimately help us in the long run. 0.45% averages out to about $13 a year on the average property tax. That's not my understanding of what this will roll out in terms of what it will cost the average property owner. Could we have some clarification on what this potentially will cost the average property owner so that th those numbers are correct? So the average property owner would see an increase to their taxes of approximately 0.5%. The average home in the home, I believe, is around 327,000, a mill rate of 9%. So the average person would see about a $28 increase, I was going to say. Right? 1%. No, no, $13. That's about right. I was going to say $13, $14. I think that actually, that is uh, approximately correct, yes. I guess then my st still my comment is that the majority of people on this council, and I challenge you on this, ran on the principle of not raising taxes, and this is raising taxes. Very good. Anyone else? Councilor Oakson. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. Uh, I sympathize, I agree with the two ladies here uh, regarding the, the principle behind it. Uh, I did vote against it originally, but uh, after council approved the first reading I, or approved the proposal, I've uh, voted for it. Uh, I believe the project is worthwhile, and I think the protections are probably as good as we can do. Uh, the increased income from taxes alone, if the project goes ahead, even on the smallest amount, would uh, give us a payback in a very short period of time. Uh, if we don't do this, uh, I believe this project would have died and, and, and who knows what will happen with it even now. So I think that we do need to be involved with this. Uh, you say that we wouldn't support or are, don't support other businesses. Uh, I suspect if somebody, a local business person, came with a project like this, we would be more than happy to be involved with them in some way. Uh, and I think the city has done similar things in the past with other projects. Uh, maybe not exactly the same, but certainly have supported development uh, through their involvement. Councillor Ross. Thank you, Mary Creasy. When we look 
down the road a 10 or 20 year master plan to recreate uh, recreation master plan of a swimming pool enhancement of 20 million or uh, a much needed replacement of a fire hall that's probably going to be 8 to 12 million or a public works that's been set aside for years to come that needs to be uh, moved and rebuilt. Uh, if we think we're going to be remain at the uh, CPI of uh, our uh, consumer, consumer price index tax increases and we don't have projects like this to move forward, we're going to be significantly higher than CPI tax increase to, to provide buildings and recreation master plans that we need and there are some of these buildings that really do need to take place in my opinion and we looked at and evaluated it uh, initiating even within our term so uh, this is in my opinion a vision of moving forward that the cost of the loan is a uh, as a small part in the return, and I think there'll be many, many things to follow, and I think there's a lot more benefits, and I respect the, <clears throat> the concerns, but uh, I think you gotta weigh up the risks of it not happening and losing it, and not having retail and commercial development, and paying for all these expectations of roads and even our basic services in the years to come. Yes, Here, Chrissy. Um, I guess, though, when do you stop? Because in reality, one big, big box store will not satisfy the choice desires of, of the consumers in Lacombe. Con they, they want to access a number of different stores, so this is only going to satisfy that one choice. Um, do we supplement, pay $750,000 for every big box store that we want in order to keep our shoppers here? Like I, what, we have no promise that this will generally, or, or no fact that this will generally kickstart the development in that area. We might have a large building come, <laughs> which I'll get the square footage, but I won't say it. Um, we might have a large building come, but we have no guarantee that this is going to truly bring uh, a significant commercial tax base and we'll have to pay seven hundred fifty thousand dollars every time for another building to come in like that's that's hard to yeah well I, I would hope not uh, but I would think that uh, when we have uh, development like this come in where we're talking 14 acres of development I think the each of those cases would have to be looked at uh, I mean, our, when you talk about investment into the community, like uh, Councillor Ross uh, mentioned, I mean, this is an opportunity to incre increase our commercial tax base by a considerable amount. And w we need to take the advantage of these situations. They don't come along every day. And the hard work of some of the people that were involved with this is commendable. Uh, do I like the investment? No, but I think we have to do it. And uh, if somebody else had a similar project, I would look forward to, to working with them. Councilor Jacobson. Sure. Excuse me. So I'd just like to point out a couple of things um, and preface it by saying I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for the consistency and principle displayed by um, both Councilors Hoekstra and Gibbs. Um, uh, that being said, for me, um, uh, this project was never about is this a is this a great way of doing business, um, and I'd like to also point out that there, it is unfortunate that we can't have a full public debate about the reasoning behind this. However, I point out that that's why we were elected. We are the representatives of the citizens. Um, there are a lot of things that we discuss in camera, you know, on all kinds of matters that unfortunately don't get public debate. The citizens trust us to cast their votes, uh, and uh, that's obviously reflected in the split opinion here. Um, However, all that being said, um, uh, like I said, this, this decision or this, this, this issue is never about is this a great way of doing business and it's not about are we casting a precedent because we're not a court of law, we're not bound by previous decisions to accommodate any of the businesses that come in. This is about, this is a stated need, during, I mean anybody who knocked on more than four doors knows, knows that it came up. This is a stated need in the community. Um, this council is aware that you know investigations were made to discover, you know, where where the gaps were and was holding it up, and and of course um, you know 
this was ultimately what was come, what, what came forward. Now, all the reasons and and, and all, all the all the decision making behind it, unfortunately, can't be discussed until such time as we are legally able to do so in public. Um, but I'm comfortable. And one more thing, I just want to point out. Um, Investments do not guarantee a return. You hope you have a return, but unless you're going for a one or two percent, <laughs> um, investments don't guarantee return. Um, and I would point out too that no, this is not public infrastructure. We're not getting pipes in the ground, but this is something that um, has a gigantic multiplying potential for people who will use it from all over the community. So this isn't just benefiting, um, you know, one chunk of town. This is this is potentially going to benefit everybody in town. So I think there is a little bit of a straight. Um, perception or pardon me of a straight metaphor there. So all that being said, I obviously do support this um, and I'm happy to uh, hang my potentially four years on council on this. Um, I'm very aware that this is an aggressive move. I'm very aware that this is not a conservative move. Uh, however, I do think that the potential upside for this uh, far outweighs uh, the downside and I will be the first to tell Councillor Hoekstra that I was totally wrong if in fact I am. <laughs> Any further uh, comments or discussion? Thank you for that. Uh, Councilor Ross, you had uh, second or proposed uh, second reading, I believe. So I'll call the question. All those in favor? Thank you. And those opposed? Duly noted. Thank you. Councilor Connor. Council move third reading at bylaw 462. Thank you for that. Do we have any uh, additional comments before we move into third reading? Go ahead, Councilor Hoekstra. Thanks, Mayor Creasy. I would like to make one more additional comment is that um, some of the rationale behind this is that citizens need or want shopping. Um, I think that the we have not truly polled them in a professional way because if the question was are you willing to pay to get more shopping in Lacombe I think you would get a very different answer than what we heard at the doors when people when I was knocking on doors I heard we wanted clothing a clothing store for families and and I guess for us as a council we would have to answer to that question down the road that would be my number one thing I've heard um, and so are we satisfying that desire? We're not sure at this point in terms of the public debate, but uh, citizens want variety and that's not what we're offering right now. Go ahead, CEO. So I did just want to clarify, <coughs> excuse me, two things. Um, the $13 that we just talked about, that is $13 per year for 15 years. That is not a one make sure that we're clear there. Um, and then I think, Councillor Hibbs, you had mentioned that there's no obligation or no commitment that the, the beyond just commencing construction. Uh, but there is actually three triggers there. There's uh, apply for uh, development permit within 30 months, commence construction within 36 months, and complete construction within 48 months. So there still would be uh, a commitment act to construction completion. Anyone else? Double check in here. So we do have a uh, third reading before us. All those in favor and opposed? Thank you very much. And so the next item that we have uh, before us under unfinished business is Director Thompson is going to bring us the Black, Forward, Black Falls Stormwater Master Plan uh, update. I certainly can, Mr. Mayor Creasy. Just wanted to highlight uh, bylaw 400.17 under bylaws if you intended to. I appreciate that in my haste to get through uh, some items. I've crossed that one off my list, so thank you for bringing that up. And. Manager Bonnet, if you could join us as well. 
when the stormwater uh, master plan afterwards, and right now we're going through bylaw 400.17 for the zoning uh, amendments to C6. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. Uh, this, uh, uh, this is the purpose of the report is to recommend third reading to bylaw 400.17. Uh, there's three components to this bylaw. Uh, there's changes to the existing definitions, there's the creation of the C6 district, and then there's the actual rezoning of the three properties that are uh, within Lacombe Market Square. And first reading was given on August 13th, and second reading was September 10th. And we are recommending council give third and final reading to this bylaw. Thank you. Anyone have any questions or concerns with this item? Councilor Ross? <coughs> so make the motion, uh, thank you, Mayor Creasy. I'll make the motion that council give third reading to Bella 4 and 17. Is that as amended or not? As presented? As presented? Yep. It's further down, it says amended. As an alternative, yes. Okay, the council give third reading to bylaw 400.17. I've seen a tremendous amount of red lace going on here. We're all prepared to vote that, obviously. Uh, all those in favor? And uh, opposed to members, thank you. Appreciate that, Manager Bonnet. And Director Thompson for uh, correcting my order of events here, too. So if you want to proceed with the Black Falls uh, Stormwater Master Plan, please. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. Uh, the town of Black Falls um, has been undergoing a, a process to um, identify how they're going to deal with their stormwater management in the north end of, of, of town. And that process involves the creation of Stormwater Master Plan. That stormwater master plan is uh, has been vetted through Alberta Environment through an approval process, and the part of that <coughs> process requires um, required them to or required Alberta Environment to seek out statements of concern from um, the general public who may um, feel that they were impacted by the town of Black Falls's um, stormwater master plan proposal. Um, that plan, uh, certainly Well Brook, which goes through the west area of Lacombe, is a water body that outlets from Lacombe Lake. And Black Falls' stormwater master plan includes um, Lacombe Lake in their outlet channel. And so when Lacombe received that uh, statement of concern, or was, was given the opportunity to submit a statement of concern, um, City Council in July 2017 had uh, had resolved to submit a statement of concern um, for three reasons. Um, their the proposed development represented an increase of 30 percent in the lakes catchment area. The there was uh, a project that was underway at the time to identify the flood hazard mapping uh, around Welp Brook, so to identify what the flooding limits of Welp Brook um, were through town through the city and uh, that project was not uh, yet concluded and um, there was a potential for um, uh, well, potential for contaminants and pollutants to enter the, into the watershed uh, at that time in the, in the earlier stages of, of, of their development and so Black Falls in total had received 19 statements of concern uh, through, uh, through that process and has identified a number of uh, additional initiatives that they, are under, they have undergone to Address those statements of concern, and so a number of uh, a number of them are identified in the in the memo, uh, including the completion of the flood hazard mapping. And the, um, they completed some additional stormwater modeling and confirmed the uh, the downstream impact as a result of the stormwater uh, master plan um, would be uh, negligible in, in terms of the effect on Welp Brook, and that the town is committed to um, best management practices on for stormwater quality 
and they have committed funding to the development of an environmental stewardship master plan guide for internal and external stakeholders on, on policies around stormwater management. And so with this, with Black Falls' response to the city statements of concern, the administration has no further um, comments or concerns regarding the negative impacts of their, the stormwater master plan. And uh, the administration is recommending the council send a letter to the town of Black Falls indicating, indicating that. If there's any questions, we have yet. Thanks, Director Thompson. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Ross. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. Uh, this is still not an ongoing issue between the county and the town of Black Falls. So, like, is it kind of premature to be agreeing that it may not be an issue, but they're still it's still in discussions? So uh, it's not that we're saying that there's no issue. We're saying that uh, concerns from the city of Macomb have been satisfied. There may be uh, concerns the Macomb County residents have, and, and they are obligated to satisfy those to the discretion of Alberta environment. Uh, but the concerns that were raised by the city in the past have been uh, addressed through their subsequent process. But that could still change. If there's no agreement in place, then it's still a gray area. Is it not? Well, I think um, so. The town of Blackfolds is trying to get that agreement in place, and one of the difficulties for them uh, has been that, of course, upper environment takes it very seriously when a downstream community expresses concern about an upstream community's stormwater management. So <coughs> they're not going to be able to move forward until they get some sort of an endorsement from the, the city of Wacombe. But at the open house that night, there was a lot of objections to. So I don't know. I just it feels kind of awkward. So, Director Thompson, in the uh, letter drafted by the previous mayor, there was a number of concerns that were identified. Um, are there any that we are unsure that have been uh, addressed in this uh, master plan? Um, no, the town of Blackwell has gone an extent, completed an extensive amount of work to. Uh, to address the city's concerns and, and as well as the number of the concerns of, of I presume all of the 19 statements of concern they received. Um, we received a quite a thick package uh, in response to, to all of them and so uh, as far as the impact to Wilbrook and to the city of Lacombe, um, administration doesn't see um, there being any further concern with the stormwater master plan and black as well. Thanks. I appreciate you clarifying that. I had a uh, a lengthy letter came coming from a concerned party that uh, had su suggested that uh, some of them were not, and uh, I just want on record that in fact they, they have been. That was a substantial uh, plan that was sent us, and uh, well, that certainly uh, satisfied my uh, points that were of concern. I'm by no means an expert, so I appreciate you for uh, clarifying that uh, master plan. We don't have any more input. We're looking for some direction. Councillor Oakshire? I'll move that council direct administration to send a letter to the town of Black Falls indicating that the city of Lacombe's concerns regarding the potential impacts of the Northwest Area Master Stormwater Management Plan to Weltbrook through the city of Lacombe have been satisfied. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Hibbs? Thank you, Mayor Creasy. So just before we go to a vote with that, I just have a, a question. So um, like of the points here that the town of Black Pulse has confirmed through their response that, and there's all these bullets, that, so the final two are the town has committed to new best management practices meant to improve water quality, and the town has committed funding to the development of an environmental stewardship master plan guide. So, I mean, these, these things are kind of, um, you know, going forward, we're going to do, we've committed to doing these things. By us saying that we feel that our concerns, when I say our, I mean the city's concerns have been, I guess, addressed. Um, at some future time when maybe it's brought to our attention that, you know, maybe maybe it isn't adequate or, or people feel that it's not adequate, uh, are we at that point able to, 
you know, um, I don't know, advocate on their behalf saying, you know, you, you uh, had committed to the funding of the development of an environmental stewardship master plan, but um, residents are telling us that they don't feel that's adequate. So well, I guess what I'm saying is this isn't a final, done, never get to say anything again. Like we're still involved in the process as this, as this unfolds is my question, I guess, in kind of a long, convoluted way. I think there, if there is demonstrated impacts after the fact, then certainly we would raise those concerns about the environment, work with the town of Blackfalls and Alberta environment to make sure that they're mitigated. Um, I think that no matter what, when you have development, there is impacts downstream. And what's important is that uh, the town of Blackfalls has exceeded the standards set by Alberta Environment and Parks for what those acceptable impacts would be. Um, so when they say they're committed to uh, an environmental stewardship plan and best management practices, that's a commitment to going above and beyond what is the minimum standard. Councilor Gullickson. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. Yeah, both Councilor Ross and myself were at the open house for this, and uh, I thought the town of Black Falls did a really good job in a difficult circumstance because there was a lot of emotion involved. But I think that they're going, like uh, CEO Gowdy said, beyond what they need to do. And obviously, if they never did, if they don't do it, then the, whatever we say here, the agreement is void. They have to do it. And I, I believe that uh, uh, their commitment to, to, to do this pro project properly is uh, very high. Councilor Jacobson. Sorry, it just strikes me that this situation is not somewhat dissimilar to when we all pay attention to regarding a pipeline Alberta in BC. Um, so if uh, if they've gone above and beyond to satisfy the requirements of our environment, I think it behooves us as good neighbors to, to stand by the experts behind that. We all done? With that, uh, I believe it Councilor Ross that uh, put forward a motion. Councilor Rooster, sorry about that. Everybody's clear what they're voting on? I'll call the question. All those in favor? Unanimous, thank you. And Manager DeBresser, do you want to come back again for some other new business here for the annual budget and taxation preparation policy? Walk us through that item, please. Sure. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. Council, uh, we have updated the annual budget and taxation policy. Um, it is our recommendation that you give uh, this uh, approval to this policy as presented. The proposed changes within this policy is driven from your strategic plan, um, which indicates that uh, you would like to align future tax increases to Al the Alberta CPI index plus community growth. Um, also, uh, Council indicated that uh, you would like to alt uh, maintain optimal reserve balances. Uh, the CPI index measures the year-over-year -year price increases to Albertans have paid over a range of products. These include energy, food, shelter, household operations, transportation, rec, education and reading. Section 4 was the majority of the, the, uh, the changes there where we added in that the city, uh, the city shall use uh, uh, June 30th um, as the um, as a targeted date of uh, CPI, um, no department manager shall intentionally budget to create a surplus within their department. And the following uh, rules will govern uh, are proposed to govern the year-end surpluses that uh, we we deal with in April. They are um, any utility-funded surplus will be directed back to the corresponding utility. The Lacombe Police Service utility will be applied to the, the police operating reserve. Surpluses from wages and benefits will be applied to a general operating reserve and a surplus arising from any other department will be applied to reserves for maintaining reserve levels or a one-time expenditure. Just wanted to note that the CPI date is consistent um, with the compensation policy which indicates the estimated cost of living for employees. Aligning these dates will give administration the necessary direction for budget preparation. 
the equity and reserve policy is a, a policy that sets some um, reserve levels. Um, and in that policy, we have a general government expenses um, reserve. Um, we currently have uh, no money in that that reserve for any unexpected, but you know, any unexpected expenses that come uh, come up throughout the year. And the policy also states that um, one month of general government expenses should be in there. We hope to use the surplus from wages and benefits um, per year to, to start stocking that uh, stocking that reserve for any unexpected expenses that do arise in the future. The new policy will address the Lacombe Police Commission's uh, request to have any of the surpluses uh, directed back. Um, that was presented at the July 9th meeting. And lastly, in Section 10, um, we're increasing the amount that the CAO can vary expenses within the department from $5,000 to $25,000, with the stipulation that uh, there will be no overages in that department, so it has to maintain that, that net effect. So uh, the financial implications, um, aligning future tax increases with CPI will allow administration to keep pace with the rising cost of delivering of services to Lacombe residences, uh, the residents of Lacombe without placing undue burdens on the taxpayer. Two alternatives that we are proposing here is that you can approve the policy as amended, uh, as presented, or you can vary any of the provisions in the policy as you see fit. So I'll open up for any questions. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor Ross, go ahead. Thank you, Mary Christie. So it was the CPI 2.3, because I was hearing 2.8. So the July to July CPI, <coughs> excuse me, CPI in Alberta is 2.8. Correct, yes. Um, I, I guess I wanted to add a comment, because I have had a couple of councillors mention to me the community growth portion of the, the proposed policy. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. That has been in the strategic plan since you first reviewed it. Certainly, our historical growth has been about 2.2% in Lacombe. It would surprise me to find out that Council had a tolerance for a tax increase, for example, this year of 5%, which would be the 2.8 plus 2.2. Perhaps there is, which makes our job much easier, but I would suspect that that community growth portion may be a matter of some debate for some councillors. Uh, the CPI, Alberta CPI, using that as the base though, so that's something that's supported by even some of your more fiscally hawkish uh, groups, such as the Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses, uh, that supports even the CPI as a, as a base for tax increases, exclusive of new services. So, so I think that's prudent. I would draw your attention to the inclusion of community growth as something you want to you want to look at. But it'd certainly be interesting in hearing from the individual councillors who understood the direction to include uh, community growth as well as uh, in addition to the community consumer price index. Uh, Councillor Connick. Sorry, I was going to comment on another matter. Councillor Jacobson? Uh, as, as I mentioned privately, I genuinely don't remember the community growth being part of the strategic plan. Um, so that being said, I am certainly not in support of anything other than the CPI being used to um, measure our year-on-year -year tax increases. Councillor Gullickson? Thank you, Mayor Tracy. I also agree with that. I, I don't think we should be using community growth as a, a measure for the, the tax increase. Uh, I think the CPI is more than enough of a guideline for us. Councillor Hughes, did you have your uh, item as well? Or no? Not okay. the first time. Thank you. I'll go back to you then, Councillor Connick, with your additional point. Thank you, Mayor Tracy. Just you referenced in here a few times, talk about a police operating reserve. It's more of a police reserve because it's capital as well. There's only one reserve line to draw capital and operating if need be. I'm just looking for clarification. Yes, uh, based, uh, yeah, we presented uh, the financials last year and it was indicated that um, the police would have, from memory, 124,000 going into an operating reserve. Um, they do have a capital reserve as well, um, but you'll see 
We don't budget for surpluses, so you would only see the transfer to reserve on the Police Commission's budget for about $84,000. So this will be over, you know, at, at year end, we roll out all the numbers and we'll determine what the surplus you know, from the Police Department would be. Yeah, I get that, but I'm just, like, I'm looking at the GL report and it's just one reserve line, so I just, it's, it's not just an operating reserve, it's a capital reserve, too. Just... There, there will be two different reserves that the police have access to. Um, the the ten year well the ten year capital budget has enough contributions in there to fund the the capital portion of the ten year capital for the police. Um, anything over and above that will be still in the police reserve, but we can definitely change the name. But we do distinguish on the accounting records that there's a a capital reserve for the police as well as the operating. Okay, I just I don't I don't see the capital reserve in the jail, but that's we can we can have a shut up. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. I just had a quick question about the CPI. So, in the document itself, it talks about um, shall use the uh, June 30th um, ACPI, but then the graph that's shown says July on the top of it. So, I'm just a little bit confused. And we talked about like 2.8 or something. So, could you just um, give me clarification exactly which CPI it is that we're using, what month? Sorry, that was just a screenshot to show you the, the table. It wasn't the particular screenshot of July 30th. Sorry. Yeah, Councillor so Ross. Thank you, Mayor Chrissy. <clears throat> I guess just kind of curious, to know, just for information, is how regionally throughout the province the CPI varies, because we're kind of lumped into, I'm sure, housing and some communities are higher or lower. It'd just be interesting to know where Central Alberta stands. I know this is a provincial average, but they got a vary between throughout the province. Mr. DeBress, would you care to elaborate on that? Yeah. Yes, I uh, I can't delve down to too much. Um, pretty much, we use the the standard um, that's called the Alberta CPI da dashboard. Um, it only goes province to province across, um, showing the different variants. I haven't found a, a statistic website or a stats counter that actually delves into to the central region. In saying that, there could be one out there, um, but it could go either way. Um, could be higher, could be lower, of course. And I would also ask our CAO if he has any additional information that he would like to address for that subject. Um, I haven't seen it. I. I I'm looking at Edmonton's website. It appears they use the general Alberta CPI, so I would think that they would have a regional one if there was that level of distinction. But uh, I was just curious to believe we have okay, prior to the Fort Murray fire and like high established energy mm -hmm. times, you couldn't touch a house of Fort Murray for twice as much, right? Because that's an extreme example. But I just kind of lump the whole province into one number. Just, you know, I may come back and pay this if you look into it, but I was just kind of curious, that's all. Councilor Uchtra? Well, I'm sorry, just one moment. I didn't, sorry, I, I, I need to correct what I said. Edmonton is using a regionally specific inflation number, so there may be some regional specificity. We'll, we'll have a look. Uh, but certainly your policy is Alberta CPI. Thank you for that, uh, Councilor Uchtra. Thanks, Mr. Creasy. Um, I was curious about your comments around the general operating reserve. How long has that reserve been at zero? Yeah, good question. I, um, I think I've been here four years, just coming up four years. Um, I didn't realize the equity reserve policy had that in there until I read it and was like, hmm. Um, thought about ways how we're going to fund that, because um, it does say we should have some general operating reserve money sitting on the side. Um, uh, the city of Brooks uses the same analogy of um, budgeting for wages and any, any surplus from, from wages goes aside there. It does two things, it, it kind of smooths out our wages. Um, we try and budget um, to the actual positions that we have and the actual steps within the grid. Um, Brooks, budgets, well, the, Brooks uh, actually budgets um, a little bit higher. Um, say if we replace a position at a lower level, that's going to create a surplus within the year, and they, they found it feasible to allocate that surplus and keep the wages 
not from jumping all over from year to year. So if I understand you correctly then we would that would not be an increase to the budget per se in order to build up that reserve. through the alternatives that we have here before us, is there any that uh, seem more fitting at this time? Thanks for asking this. Thank you, Mike Christy. So to go to regional, we have to create a whole different policy then. It would just, wouldn't be something you would explore for 2019 because obviously we've already we're already into budget planning within administration. I don't know if that necessarily presents a problem. Do we know if, if that number is different or if, if one if one exists for that? Do we? So I think we can discuss that at the time if, if it varies substantially. Would that be reasonable? I'll pass on. Councillor Jacobson, go ahead. Again, I'd like to propose an amendment to this policy to remove community growth from it. Thank you. In saying that, would you uh, care to make a motion in that regard uh, to approve the policy as amended? Yeah, I did. Did you want to have like first an amendment voted on and then go to the to you. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, that's the only one that I'll I'll make the motion that we approve this policy uh, with the amendment that we remove community growth uh, as part of the calculation for tax increase. Thank you. Any additional input on that uh, motion as presented then? Uh, seeing that, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Uh, Thank you. Appreciate it. And so next up, our CAO wanted to go through a council and legislative item for the October 1st committee meeting. So this, <coughs> excuse me, the city uh, has a committee meeting every year where, or sorry, an organizational meeting every year where uh, appointments to uh, external boards, agencies, and commissions are confirmed or reaffirmed, um, and we set meetings for the upcoming year. This year we are proposing to move it to your committee meeting date and thus to pass those to pass those uh, those motions required for setting the dates. It does need to be a regular meeting rather than a committee meeting. Uh, we're proposing this just to balance workflow and we have some of the uh, uh, external agencies presenting on the 9th, so we wanted to make sure that we have maximum flexibility of, of passing motions. Um, nothing more than that. Councillor Ustra? I move that council schedule a regular organizational council meeting for October 1st. Thank you for that. Other input? All those in favor? Thank you. Let's uh, just do the presentation that they do. And the next uh, item up under transportation services, I'll have Director Thompson go through the uh, recommendation for award of the taxi May extension. Mayor Christie, uh, for council tonight is uh, a recommendation to award the Airport North Taxiway Extension contract to DB Bobcat Services Limited in the amount of $123,215. Um, this project was a, a project identified in the current uh, capital plan in the uh, for the city and uh, as well as the airport. It's a project that's funded through partnership with the club, um, the city of Lacombe and Lacombe County. Uh, the a competitive bid process was undertaken to, uh, to ascertain uh, market pricing for the extension of the taxiway at the, at the airport. Um, bids ranged from, we have four proposals as a result of that process, and they ranged from $123,000 to $419,000. 
and the lowest bid was from DB Bobcat Services, and uh, we are proposing to award the contract to DB Bobcat. Uh, with the inclusion of uh, the engineering that was uh, undertaken for that uh, taxiway, the project does come in um, over budget. Um, the budget for the project was $128,000, and with engineering, the project comes in at $142,000. Um, a breakout amongst the partners is included in the memo. Um, the Flying Club has, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Director Vaughn, has confirmed their, their ability to pay their portion over and above what they budgeted. And so um, with that, if there's any other questions, then happy to take them. I'm sorry, go ahead. Thanks, Mayor Creasy. And to confirm the Flying Club and Lacombe County that they're in agreement to do this as well as the lighting project? Separate. Yes, the two separate contracts. Yeah, they've already confirmed the, the lighting project and then um, there, this is from their from their plan, and so right. Because I kind of I remember their staggered capital plan, but the lighting project, whoops, got bumped up, right? So this is <laughs> get that glass out of my way. This is, puts two projects in one year that wasn't the plan. Is that correct? Yeah. Think, um, yes, is the is the. Uh, so that is correct. So this project was in the ten-year capital plan for this year. The extraordinary plan was the advancement of the runway lighting, and that was advanced um, in light of the fact that we received grant funds to offset the cost of that project. So City Council and Lacombe County Council passed resolutions about the extraordinary runway lighting project. Dr. Thompson, I'm just curious, uh, when, when is this work to be completed by? for the end of the season is the, the thing that is here. Okay, I guess the reason I bring it up is there's an extreme variance in pricing on this particular item. And perhaps the overall dollar amount maybe isn't that much, but you consider it's nearly almost four times as much between the low and high. Um, I'm just curious, is this a, is this a poor time of year to have had uh, the bids go out for a project like this, or what? Is, is there any particular uh, factor that you would suggest result in, in the bid variance that we have? I think certainly tendering a project to be completed this year, especially when it involves a substantial portion of asphalt, would be considered likely later in the year. Um, and <coughs> I would say that that is indicative of some of the higher end pricing that we're seeing in, in the bids. Um, I would suspect that contractors are are saying, what do I have my crews committed to today? Mm -hmm. And if I'm pulling them away from that commitment and putting them towards yours, this is I need to make some money there. I need to uh, get a return on that. And so that is why the pricing is, is as it is. And I imagine some contractors probably read into it saying, well, they, they seem to be toward the end of the year. They're probably not going to get very many bids, so I'm going to throw in a high bid. However, I think the pricing that we got from DB Bobcat was, was competitive and is indicative of the of, I'd say normal competitive market conditions. If we had bid this project at any point in the year, I think their pricing was in, would be in line with, uh, with the uh, I guess antici anticipated range we would get from a, from a bid around the budget. So I think the pricing we did, we did get from, a, from, from DB is, is, is competitive and is in line with what we expect for this project, regardless of what we bid. Okay, thank you. Councilor Gautzen? Uh, I'd like to make the motion that Council award the Lacombe Regional Airport North Taxiway Extension contract to DB Bobcat Services Limited in the amount of 123215 plus GST. Just for some further clarification there, because that includes the construction portion only, then obviously this contract is not 
boot engineering, that was a completely separate item? Correct, yes. Okay. Just want to make sure that that was as intended. Okay. And do we have any uh, additional input on this item? If not, I'll call the question. All those in favor? That appears to be unanimous. Thank you. We missed any items before we get into reports. Go ahead. Uh, just <clears throat> on that organizational meeting that I had mentioned, uh, the other thing is you will review your seating around the table. So I guess if you have any requests there, speak to the mayor, as well as any changes to the commission's board or committees that you're appointed to uh, at this time. Sorry, I didn't mention it earlier. Okay. So we'll go through the reports quickly before we take a break to uh, speak with um, our media representatives here, if they so choose. I can start out uh, at an MPC meeting on September 5th, uh, approved uh, a couple of uh, so a homemade business or home uh, based business and denied one for a, a, a garden suite. And they also approved an overheight commercial fence, which is kind of unusual than I thought, but it uh, makes for an attractive uh, uh, development in our town, downtown core, I believe. An AHS meeting um, with Lyle McKellar, the Executive Director of Emergency Medical Services, along with CA O'Gowdy and Councillor Ross. And I believe that we're going to be hearing from uh, uh, Mr. McKellar at our next weekly meeting. And the uh, Sustained Technologies look home visit there, uh, just to follow up. Um, there was two representatives from that company that were here speaking to uh, uh, a few of us. And once again, the area interest letter uh, responses were requested prior to the end of this month. And I think that so far, I think I've got nine that have been returned so far. Central Alberta Mayors and Reeves meeting. Uh, speaker from EPCOR that brought us up to date on uh, municipal LED street light conversions, of which Lacombe was um, one of the communities. Lots of talk uh, on combating crime, our cannabis uh, legislation. We're not the only community faced with uh, those talks, for sure. And the grand opening of a long-standing business within the city on September 15th, which is certainly enjoyable to do. Good to see them expanding from the, from the LA Flooring to the LA Flooring and Design Center uh, as well. So congratulations to them. And then the wastewater uh, September meeting. Um, in addition to our regular business, we did a tour of the uh, facilities, which was interesting to see the uh, uh, order uh, control facility located within the, the uh, Red Deer City, city, city limits. Um, had a regional water meeting as well there, and a training session for MPC that uh, a few of us chose to uh, participate in. That was nice to see such a great turnout for that. I think about, I'm going to say around 75 participants from uh, various communities and some as far away as Canmore, which was good to see. And as a side note, uh, I certainly received a lot of uh, compliments on the facility and facility staff at the LMC, so that was good to, good, uh, good to hear. And then also I was able to attend the Big Brothers Big Sisters uh, celebration and open house along with uh, Chief Bloom Hagen and our MLA Ron Orr, which was great to see them participating along with uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters organizations across the uh, nation uh, to celebrate September as Big Brothers Big Sisters Month. Who'd like to go next? Councillor Gullickson. 
Oh, mine is very short this time. Uh, I attended the MPC training also. I thought it was an excellent workshop and will certainly help us in the future when deliberating on, uh, at MPC on all these different issues. I also attended the Big Brothers Big Sister open house and was able to enjoy a beaver tail in the back. <laughs> Councillor Ross? Um, September 11th, the Affordable Housing Committee. We are, there's between 10 or 12 different agencies going to be conducting a homeless study to take place by FCSS. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and September 12th, Coffee Council. September 13th, the Parker Regional Library reviewed budgets and uh, had an advocacy presentation for uh, public libraries. Uh, September 10th, uh, as uh, Mayor Creasy stated, we had a uh, uh, meeting with Public Health Services uh, Director of EMS, Law McKellar. Uh, he'll be here next week. Uh, I kind of personally have an interest in that as our EMS service did 3,345 calls last year, but the concern is over 60% of them are uh, out of Red Deer Regional Hospital or Red Deer. So uh, we're going to try to uh, hopefully deal with that. There's a lot of units committed from out of, town, out of the city of Lacombe to uh, support our calls, and there's been some lengthy response times. September 15th, the FCSS budget and strategic plan. Uh, and September 19th, our FCSS monthly meeting for the discussion on the budget. And uh, September 20th, we had a FCSS Big Brothers Big Sisters meeting. Uh, we're collaborating on programs that each uh, youth, uh, youth service provides. Uh, it, was, it was a great roundtable discussion on how I think uh, our youth social programs, we can uh, have stronger collaboration and referrals. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful people that have a lot of passion for the youth. Uh, personally, I like to see between Youth Unlimited, FCSS, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, uh, I think another group at the uh, uh, Coffee Council brought up with the uh, youth, with the music festival. I think we should uh, strongly support more youth, possibly through our facility assistant grants program. Uh, I think uh, there's a big need that uh, a lot of those some great volunteers and great service providers. I think we could uh, stand behind them stronger. And the Big Brothers Big Sisters open house. So, yeah, busy week, got one week. So just one item there, Councilor Ross, as far as supporting our uh, youth-oriented uh, pro providers, there, are you suggesting that a significant portion of their budgets go towards renting facilities or? Some of the criteria through the rec board facility uh, grant is, I think, uh, only enables <coughs> the groups to access the facilities a limited number of times. So, uh, for example, FCSS does the Wednesday meal once a month. Uh, I think a different church group take turns uh, providing meals for the needy and the Coleman well, once a month. I think there's around 125, 150 people. And for example, the FCSS will pay for five, but they do ten meals, I think, a year. So, you know, like that, or Big Brothers Big Sisters, for example, they get the facility grant for one of the major events that they don't see, but they have one or two others. Or, you know, or could the uh, mentor in a little be, for example, given passes to the swimming pool to enhance more time together with these youth? Uh, you know, through the meeting with collaboration, there's there's youths that are unfortunately in some addicted lifestyles. There's uh, uh, some that are very addicted to some very strong um, uh, drugs, or and I think in every way, if we can try to support these youths to not get in that influence, and there's some great mentoring people and services available. That I think if we can uh, be a role model and you know, so. Just like Big Brothers and Sisters this month, they're trying to 40 mentors in 40 days, or, or so. I just think that could, uh, it does affect the budgets. Uh, SSS, it's, if you, you don't get it for nothing, or it's out of the budget. Same with Big Brothers Big Sisters Day, 75 percent is is uh, charity fundraised. So oh, certainly look forward. Or thank you for bringing forward that issue, and look forward to uh, any uh, potential solutions or ways that we can enhance enhance that service. So. 
Who's next? You ready? All right, thanks. Go ahead and get the counselor to sure. Thanks, Mayor Creasy. Um, so after council meeting on the 10th, and we had the, I went to a chamber board meeting on September 11th, um, they really appreciated coming um, and talking to us, and, and they, they wanted to say how approachable we were as a council, so that was, that was good feedback. They were busy working on their budget as they'll be making a presentation on the 9th and they're organizing a fundraiser. Um, I, I uh, attended the tour of the Lutheran Church with the Lacombe Performing Arts Group and that was a, a good experience just to see the building that they're talking about and what their, their dreams are for that. September 12th all day was a subdivision development appeal board training. I, Councillor Connick did that in the summer, I gather. But I believe our whole committee is trained now, and um, but we were wondering whether we needed another community member. But that's because one of us have to step. Only one of us can be present. That in the answer, to in the answer to Councillor Hoekstra's question, uh, the bylaw specifies it breaks up community members that are public and from the councillors that are that are separate as well. So bylaw specifies two councillors or up to two councillors and uh, three community members, so the quorum is four, so it still works out well. Uh, we didn't lose any community members, so we're good there. We don't have to change anything. And they're, they're long serving as of today, so uh, they, uh, they are all trained as well. Yeah, they were trained that so, day. As well as myself, I took train subsequently. The day before, yeah. So. It was interesting. Um, on September 12th in the evening, it was a full day of city stuff. Wow, what a day. Uh, coffee with Council, and um, I watched the presentation regarding the Macomb Music Festival, how uh, the President has this view, this vision for how the LMC could be utilized better. That was very interesting. I attended the FCSS Community Supper on September 19th. Today we had a Lacombe Foundation board meeting, a couple of interesting items. Um, the foundation has pledged $1,000 towards uh, creating a plan for how we, they would like to uh, rebuild the lodge. And, and housing is certainly a concern for seniors in our area, so our lodge is aging, and so there needs to be a plan about how, like what, what are our vision going forward in terms of that rebuild or um, yeah, what, what would we want proposed in that regard? So that's going to be addressed on October 10th. We hope to have some proposals in. And um, the other thing is about the CPI. Our, the, they were quoting there that a number of unions have settled at 0% zero, zero increase this year in terms of wages. And I wondered about that because we feel like in, in our world of when we've got to manage wages, we're all looking at the CPI, and again, is it 2.8, 2.3, 2.4? Um, and today we heard that it's going to be 0% across the province in terms of wage increases. So I just thought that was an interesting detail that came up at the Lacombe Foundation board meeting. So, Oh, and, and on the weekend, <laughs> I was at the University of Alberta, and I was placed at a table randomly beside a woman. She found out it was from Lacombe, and she said, any time we travel, we stop and look home for supper. She says it is the most amazing little city in our province, and she said, don't do anything to change your city. And I said, I'll pass those words on. <laughs> Thank you. Can I comment on that? Sure, certainly you can. <laughs> so we shouldn't add Bolt to, uh, shouldn't have added Bolt to our community? That was a big change. <laughs> Mm -hmm. She was talking about the, she loved all the baskets, the flowers, the, the beautiful historic downtown. Oh, Don, we need to go for coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Jacobson? Sure, my, uh, my report came in this afternoon, so I guess it, uh, it didn't make it up there, so I'll read it. Can you hear me? All right, um, so on September 6th, uh, I attended the Heritage Resources Committee. Um, so there was actually quite a substantial surplus in their operating revenue, or in their operating uh, revenue this year, um, mostly due to very frugal management, uh, not going overboard on bringing in, frankly, unnecessary stuff, and um, not a whole lot of, of grant applications. So um, 
they were kind of discussing some fancy different things to do with it, but I, I suggested that City Council certainly wouldn't uh, prejudice them if they simply rolled their surplus into their uh, grant reserve um, in anticipation of more coming in, um, and that probably council view that as uh, proper management. So, uh, And in fact, um, that's what they're probably going to decide to do. Um, I uh, attended the Alberta Public Art Network Conference in Edmonton from September 11 to 13. Uh, topics covered everything from how art can be used to raise awareness for social issues to how to properly inventory and maintain your public art. Um, I have to say that aside from some very wonderful people that I did meet in a very entertaining evening out in which I was called up to partake ad hoc in a um, sort of like live theater event, which I kind of killed, I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> in fact, I was asked if I was a plant, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, but I was actually uh, struck in general by the hubris of most people in the public art bureaucratic world. Um, to the point where I commented to an associate of mine that this place is a roiling mass of holier-than-thou postmodernists who are thoroughly convinced of their own enlightenment. Um, and that's genuinely how I feel about it. <laughs> so, um, it was an eye-opening conference to say the least. Um, I did attend the Art Endowment Committee meeting. Um, the general policy book was reviewed, as well as a marketing plan to grow the endowment fund. And it was decided that a yearly private art gala featuring the recipients of the previous year's grant money for the current and prospective donors would be a great way to showcase the program. And finally, I attended the rec board meeting. I had to step out for two hours to deal with something, um, but I actually did. So the, the gentleman who's involved with Home Music Festival came and presented to us. Um, and I'd recommend that if he wants to come up, uh, present to council, that we just highlight the time limit for him, because he was uh, very loquacious. Um, so, uh, so yeah. Um, but. Uh, yeah, that's all I've been after the last few weeks. Thank you, Councillor Jacobson. You brought up a good point about uh, reports uh, being here electronically. And I just wanted to remind everyone that they are intended to be in at the latest, uh, according to our procedural bylaw. I think it's appropriate that I reiterate it here that uh, no later than noon on the Wednesday preceding the meeting day. Not that there's anything magical of having it that early, other than it does create some significant uh, extra workload for IT and whatnot to reload everything and whatnot. It seems like a minor thing, but um, in future, if we could all do our best to get those in lives, we would certainly appreciate it. So the only problem I have with that is it seems to be that a lot of my meetings, particularly Echo and Art, seem to come in Thursdays and Fridays between the Wednesday and Council. So, I mean, should I just then? save those to the next meeting then? Is that how you prefer to have it happen? I would suggest that that would be appropriate rather than missing out on it. Sure. Councillor Hibbs? Thank you. So I too also have a paper format. I was a little busy last week. I don't know what I was up to. but <laughs> So a lot of the uh, events that I attended have already been reported on, so I'm not really going to go through all those, you know, the NPCs and, and council meetings, etc. I also attended the, the um, tour of the, of the church. Um, I did want to comment uh, on the MPC trainings. There was 13 communities, what I counted, that were there. So, you know, we filled a, a room at the LMC and it was very good training. And it also happened to back up a decision that was made at an earlier um, MPC where we had rejected a, a request for an addition to a garage for a garden suite. And it was because um, by approving that, it would have been asking us to vary um, too far beyond what our abilities were. And we had a little bit of a debate during NPC whether we could or couldn't, and, and so I was relieved that we made the right decision, and quite likely, um, I will assume it will make it up to the um, appeal board, which, where it should. Um, it, it was hard to say, no, you can't have that, but simply the, the bylaw just didn't allow us to do that. So, so I thought that was uh, good. Um, we're doing pretty good, I think, in this community as far as how we um, operate our MPC. It felt like we were right in line with what we were being taught. Maybe a few little tweaks here and there for some best practice, but otherwise, I, I, you know, I think we can have some good confidence that we're, we're doing things right. Um, I guess I just wanted to mostly focus on um, the community feedback um, items on, on my report. And so I have three here. Uh, one is the downtown, or is downtown business consultation, and I mean this kind of on whole, and I recognize that Councillor Ross actually also mentioned this earlier when we talked about the smoking bylaw. So I had a very uh, good conversation with a business owner downtown who um, 
feels that perhaps when we are making some of the decisions and we talk about being business friendly, that maybe we're not engaging the business community as well as we could, that perhaps we're relying on maybe the Chamber of Commerce to be kind of that conduit, but um, is that really fair? Because that's not necessarily representing all business in town. And so perhaps when we're making decisions that um, may affect downtown in particular, for example, that maybe we want to make a more concerted effort to try to, to talk to those, uh, those people. Um, I uh, also want to just sort of pass on um, kudos that I've been hearing a lot and maybe my fellow councillors have as well in regards to the sort of the community standards split. So, um, I mean, that's definitely been something where, you know, the nuisance bylaw has been a real nuisance for people and we've got some some properties in town specifically that, you know, haven't been... So I've been getting a lot of really positive feedback like, hey, look, they're doing something. So I just wanted to pass that on. But that's what I'm hearing. I'm sure I'm not the only one. And then the final thing that I wanted to talk about, actually, and I had a, a few questions about this, and it goes back to a motion that we passed in May 28, and it has to do with the Allen Cup, and I think you might know what I'm going to ask. So that was a two-part motion. One of them, one part of that motion was to give a reduced cost on the ice for the Allen Cup. The other half of that was that the city would provide paint and supplies for the arena bleachers, and that the labor would be provided by um, the organization. So it has been brought to me by a few different people questioning what actually happened with the bleachers. So I guess what I would like to have is some reassurance that um, that we, you know, lived up to our side of the deal and provided the paint, the $6,500 worth of paint. But I'd like to hear that um, the committee lived up to their side of the bargain and also provided the labor and that city employees were not left doing that job. Thank you for that. And we'll see if we're addressing those two items after we're done reports. Uh, Councillor Connick. Thank you, Mayor Creasy. Um, my report is there. Just a couple of quick comments. Just a quick comment to Councillor Hibbs in terms of the downtown um, business. Um, as you all know, I was there for 10 years, and we tried many a time to create a downtown business association. And so if, if you have people come to you about that type of comment from why doesn't, my comment to them would be, that they should really try because we talked about it and, and then it was just never nobody wanted to take the ball and go with it run with it so beginning with comments like that just encourage them to maybe phone a, or form a downtown business association and then that group can then become an entity and present to council that's that's what i would encourage them to do because you're right it's these one-offs but it was a struggle for 10 years i, I always tried to but nobody wanted to try and organize it but that's just my own comment there um, my report is there. The only comment I wanted to make was coffee with council. When will we, we will will we receive the results of those comments? Is that coming at the ninth? Um, <clears throat> we're targeting the ninth to bring those comments back to council. Um, we have followed up with a number of them already, and then we'll be asking for a little bit further direction if there is additional items that you want. Okay, thank you. And then yeah, I know a couple of councillors alluded to Dr. Craig Colgrain, or I think is his last name. I do saw his presentation, very interesting, and I do hope that he gets the chance to present to council as well. He is coming on the first. On the first? Perfect. He is coming on the first, and we have reminded him about the time. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Connick, just a little clarification. It looks like to me that you had a very busy uh, police commission meeting. Mm -hmm. Is the 520 calls for service in July, is that... Uh, up substantially from years previous, or is that uh, on trend? Uh, uh, basis? I just want to no, that's kind of on trend. I, I could pull it up here for you, but um, no, not significantly higher. No, no. Thank you, Councillor Ustra. Um, I would just like to highlight that the Rikabitsu group of um, friends is here this weekend or right now. And tomorrow they will be doing a city tour. So if you see them, please bring them greetings from us. Uh, tomorrow evening they will be um, having their ready their farewell banquet, uh, which is amazing that went so fast. And thanks to Councillor Connick because he kind of did everything well. And Mayor Creasy for me. <laughs> and our monthly significant reports, uh, or advanced report rather, by our CAO, please. 
case. And uh, my computer has given me trouble right up there. So things that I would highlight from the monthly significant events report, um, I would skip down to the external relations. Um, we did get a chance to meet with the executive director of the Chamber of Commerce to discuss their policy presentation and a plan to move forward, I guess, collaboratively with them. Um, we do have kind of an exciting idea that uh, you'll hear more about during our, our budget presentation that I think will involve the Chamber of Commerce and start to build some of that link um, between the city and, and the Chamber. It maybe hasn't been as strong as it could be in the past. I also attended the HS groundbreaking and the sustain, uh, sustain energy uh, group. Um, and then we will be receiving the AUMA Award for Sustainability through Collaboration this week at uh, AUMA, so certainly that was exciting and recognition of good work by this community and uh, some of our partners in the region. And if anyone has any questions, uh, Councillor Hibbs uh, brought up some items. Mm -hmm. Here to uh, paint was the question, and Brenda has the answer. I have a few comments. Um, just in terms of Councillor Ross's questions regarding the city supporting youth, um, there's two mechanisms in place right now, and one is the the amount of the grant that City Council allots to the Recreation and Culture Board and groups go through that process to apply to have rental fees for uh, city facilities reduced or supplemented. And so that's one mechanism that we may want to increase that grant because I know that generally speaking it is oversubscribed and so more groups come and ask for higher levels of support than the budget will allow. So that's one mechanism. And then um, the second one is when the community groups come, that's certainly the time when they can highlight local needs and concerns and potential solutions or ideas to address those things. So those are the two mechanisms in place right now, uh, and certainly if we can be of assistance in any other way, we'd be happy to do that. Um, in terms of the downtown businesses, um, I am thinking about Councillor Connick's comments as well. That's one of the struggles that we have is there is not a unified, um, centralized voice. And so uh, I wouldn't want anyone thinking we're not consulting because there is a good deal of con conversing that goes on. And uh, certainly that's a goal we have to be speaking with people appropriately and regularly and timely and all those things. So, um, but that is one of the limitations that we have is that if it would be so great if we could have just a central or unified mechanism um, that would allow us to communicate um, with that group. And so we continue to hope that we will be able to come up with some kind of group or mechanism to help that. Um, in terms of the painting at the arena, I would have to actually follow up on that. I don't know. I do know that there were generals peoples there painting. I was over there a few times and they were painting. I do also know that city staff did the numbering of the seats, and that was simply to ensure that it was done um, well. I guess that's the only, painting numbers is a very hard thing to do. And so I know that we did the numbering of the seats, but as to what other investments we made, I would have to uh, follow up with the facility manager. Was there one other concern that you had as well? Very no. good. So, it's <coughs> nearly 8 o'clock, let's uh, to uh, take a break after that until uh, quarter after 8, we'll reconvene after that, so, and until then we've got uh, Councillor Cotter. How is someone to accept the reports as presented? Thank you. All those in favour? Thank you. Back at 8.15.